for the international journal ASOR. Dr. Shah is on the editorial board of the prestigious Journal of the Orthopedics and Scientific Research, main coordinator for more than 48 cities in India and moderator of the Saturday evening lectures with the AOS Rosemont, Chicago, since first ever till today, which is the 19th. Maximum number of webinars and virtual orthopedic conferences conducted on various topics of orthopedics for around 5,000 plus participants. Honorable Orthopedic Consultant Nanavati Hospital, Sefi Hospital, ST Elizabeth Hospital, Kambala Hill Hospital, X Nair, X HN, uh, HNH Hospital panelist on the ONGC, has many publications and papers at national and international level to his account and has been an active sportsman and musician. We welcome Dr. Shah. So next moderator is Honorable Professor Dr. A.K. Pal. The youngest professor at the age of 42 years with head of department of and is the head of department of orthopedics and traumatology IPGM uh, MR SSKM Medical College Kolkata West Bengal 35 international and national publications <laughs> author of the book on an atlas of orthopedic surgery selected as one of the inspiring orthopedicians of India for the year 2019 by Economic Times Winner of A.A. Mehta, Gold Medal 2002, Best Scientific Presentation of a Session in IOCON 2003, Best Paper in Implant Section as a Co-Author in IOCON 2004, Johnson & Johnson Traveling Fellowship of a uh, IOA in 2007, S.A. Gold Medal Award for the Best Publication in Indian Journal of Orthopedics 2012, National Award of Joy Patankar, Gold Medal for Pediatric Session of the IOCON 2019, author of Atlas of Orthopedic Radiology, second edition inaugurated in IOCON 2022 and National CME Lecturer Reviewer of uh, Indian Journal of Orthopedics. We take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Pal to the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> To take this opportunity to welcome Honorable Dr. C. Ravi. Dr. Ravi has a fellowship in arthroscopy and WOC fellowship in arthroscopy, arthroplasty and arthroscopy, HOD Department of Orthopedics, Mahavir Institute of Medical Sciences, with a 24 years of experience in orthopedics and presently working as working in Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. Dr. Ravi was Associate Professor in Deccan Medical College of Medical Sciences with teaching experience of more than 15 years. Main area of interest is joint replacement primary, difficult primary and revisions, special interest in pelvic and acetabular trauma. We take this of, uh, opportunity to welcome Dr. Ravi for the event. I also take this opportunity to Dr. Jangit currently working as the director and head Bone and Joint Institute, Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon, introduced the world the most advanced NAV3 computer navigation technique for joint replacement and Navier robot for knee replacement for the first time in India, reviewer for the Journal of Orthoscopy and Joint Surgery by Elziver. He has a vast experience of more than 21 years with 12,000 surgeries in the field of orthopedics, life member of IOA, ISHKS, DOA, BOS, ROSA, GOS, FOSME, ISKSAA, and NAMS, presently 
presented many papers in national and international conferences part of research team with multinational companies and winner of the golden hand award 2021 for surgical excellence pan fortis we take this opportunity to welcome dr jangid for the program and on behalf of ipca i take this opportunity to welcome all the delegates to talk a little about ipca we with at ipca have over 7000 700 scientists focusing on new drug development system, uh, developments with 220 patents up applications filed seven apis nine formulation manufacturing facilities in house ipca is a a fully integrated indian pharmaceutical company manufacturing over 350 formulations and 80 apis for various therapeutic segments we with ipca present you zerodol a perfect companion that understands your pain like your patient's pain like no one else the number one brand in managing every kind of pain acute to chronic with 12 12 crore satisfied patients every year and understanding pain across 27 countries we welcome all the delegates to the saturday evening lecture and with this i hand over the session to dr dilip shah thank you ashwini madam i thank you very much and if you stop sharing your screen i can share my screen very good evening to people in india and good morning uh to my fellows who are faculty from waos ota i professor dr dilip shah from mumbai extend my warm welcome to you all to the fourth webinar of waos saturday evening lectures virtual series of 20 21 and 2022 on WAS OTA orthopedic trauma update in tactics and techniques organized organized by IPCA laboratories post successful 3 WAS saturday evening lectures virtual series of 2021 2022 i'm looking forward to having yet another insightful program of knowledge and experience sharing with our colleagues from WAS and in india waos is the global leader in orthopedic learning and since 2017 we have been gaining many insights and exchanging ideas and knowledge with our fellow colleagues across the globe via the saturday evening lecture series we have great faculty we have uh, dr daniel orwitz and dr frank laporache from waos is joining us from for the question answer session along with dr ak pal from kolkata dr subhash jangid from gurugram and dr c ravi from hyderabad and of course i'll be doing from bombay i am professor dr dilip shah today we have an agenda which will cover following topics clavicle fracture indications and surgical tips to avoid complications proximal humerus fracture indications for surgery fixation versus replacement humeral shaft fracture indications for surgery reduction fixation tips distal humeral fractures approaches reduction fixation tips elbow fracture dislocations tips for staying out of trouble forearm fractures approaches and reduction techniques elderly distal radius fractures for non hand surgeons indications and how to avoid frac failures let us now begin our session from double aos faculty and connect to the interactive question answer session at 9:54 pm i request everyone to send in your questions in the chat box to make it an enriching session with great interaction 
over to AAOS OTA, Rosie Mount, Chicago. And uh, we're going to move the upper extremity. Talk about clavicle fractures. And for time reasons, I'm just going to concentrate on the on the mid clavicle today. Just to let you know in your PDF that you'll get, there are some extra slides that deal with a distal clavicle, but I won't get to them for time reasons. Um, and just in terms of disclosures, nothing really relevant. This is a recent case. A guy fell over his dog. Actually, a little bit more higher energy than that would than you would think. Uh, he's a healthy, fit guy. He's a non-smoker. He installs insulation, and he's an avid kayaker. And he's got these X-rays and uh, AP on top. And then this view, which I would suggest that you get this forty-five degree cephalad view upright. That's a very good view to look at clavicles. And so, his first question to you is: Is this going to heal? So what do we know about that? Well, in the if you in the past, many years ago, you would just say, yes, all clavicle fractures heal, and best way to get a non-unit is to operate on it. And so we treated almost all these non-operatively. Then in the late 80s and the 90s, people started to say, does this approach work? And the answer is maybe not always. As they started to look at the outcomes with patient-driven scores, such as the DASH and the constant, they found out patients had some pain and can correlate to the other side, some weakness. And then on radiologic follow-up, it turns out that displaced clavicles, on average, don't heal 15% of the time. That's a good number to remember when you're counseling patients, 15%. So then you've given that information, and he says, well, well, what are the risk factors for non-union? Do I have those? And probably our best uh, non operative clavicle data comes out of uh, Edinburgh where they treat these most of the time non-operatively. Here's a, here's a, almost a thousand patients treated non-operatively. Again, their non-union risk, uh, again, close to that 15%. And they looked at risk factors for non-union. They found three, smoking, comminution, fracture displacement, smoking, comminution, fracture displacement. And they measured that by this red arrow here. So if you look here, there's a lot of people who have very low risk of non-union, but some people who are projected to have very high risks. Our patient was right in that ballpark of them, if you put him in this formula, at 15%. So you go back and tell him that. And so he then says, well, should I get mine fixed? Well, what's the data on that? Well, the, probably the first, the best study, or the first uh, randomized study, it's very famous now, came out now almost 15 years ago out of the, uh, Canada, was this operative versus non-operative uh, uh, randomized study. And if you look at their data, they uh, randomized those. And by the intention of treat analysis, blue line was the operative group better in the constant score throughout the whole year. The blue line, again, this dash score, a lower score is better, so better throughout the whole year. So you might say on the outset, well, we should probably fix clavicles. And uh, shortly thereafter, there were five more randomized studies. And this was the first meta-analysis of those first six studies. And their data was in very pretty close together. And if you pooled the data, you saw these constant scores and dash scores were a little bit worse in a non-operative group at a year. But it, the differences were actually pretty small, actually lower than the MCID for these, these scoring systems. Again, the non-union rate was almost, it's this very, very persistent number, about 15%. So non-op did worse, but not a whole lot worse. And now there's been many more studies. Uh, uh, two more were reported at this year's OTA, and I have listed here a few uh, systematic reviews. Here's one of the most recent 22 randomized controlled trials. So we're really doing an awful lot of studies in this area. Maybe we've got enough trials now to where we can really kind of answer things definitively. And, and really, these results very consistent. Again, non-union rate in that 12 to 15%, less non-unions and less malunions with surgery, as you would expect. But the functional scores are really only slightly better in the operative group. And so another thing the patient might ask is, well, I don't really want to know, I'll compare the operative group to the, oh, the whole non-operative group. I just want to know how it compared to the union. That is, if my fracture heals non-operatively, how do I compare with those that are treated operatively? 
And that's only been done a few times, that subgroup analysis. But when it has been done, there's really been very little difference, if at all, between these two groups. So what that says to me is that you can explain most of the advantage of operative fixation by its reduction in non-union and perhaps a little bit of malunion rate. Put another way, if you can get your clavicle to heal, either operatively or non-operatively, you're likely going to be okay. So we go back to our uh, to the patient and he says, well, if there's is there a problem if I just wait and see? Can I just wait and see? What happens if you do it late? Fortunately for clavicles, the answer is where we've looked at, there's very little deficit or problem if you do your ORIF delayed versus acutely. So really what you lose if you wait and see is time, but you don't lose the ability to have a good outcome. So then he might say, well, then how long does it take to tell if I'm going to wait and see? And uh, going back to the Edinburgh group again, uh, largest series, uh, many years ago, they recommended probably six months before you could really tell if someone's going to heal or not. More recently, they've tried to do a predictor of non-union and find out that it's even at six weeks, you can kind of predict who's going to go on and heal or not. I tell my patients about eight weeks for me to be able to tell. It doesn't mean they're healed, but you can give them a good indication. So with all this data, you really can go back to your patient. I think this is the really the best fracture we probably have for the shared decision-making because if it's what's important to you. If you operative treatment, you get a more sure union rate, a quicker return to function, but there's a good chance you're going to have surgery that you really didn't need. Non-operative treatment avoids the risk of that surgery, but what you lose is time, particularly if you're someone that goes on to need a delayed surgery. So if we go back to our patient, he, um, he like most Wisconsin patients, would like to avoid surgery. Uh, he was already off work for a hand injury, so return to work was not a big issue. And so he just wanted to get back to kayaking, but he was willing to uh, avoid surgery if he could, so he chose non-operative treatment. And again, that's who most of our patients choose. So here he is at two months on the left and three months on the right, uh, no healing at all, still painful at the non-union site. And so he is now moving into a, a prediction of a non-union, and we pivoted. So in his case, we do a delayed treatment. So now the question is, how are you going to fix it? Well, there's probably a lot of different ways to do that. And here's just a variety of things. Uh, most commonly superior or anterior plates, typically with uh, absolute stability mode. You can have specialty plates. So here's an example of one here, either anterior or superior. You can put plates in bridge mode. Uh, you can use flexible nails or you can use these uh, specialty clavicle pins. I've, I've only done one of those. So I don't have a lot of experience with that, but a lot of different options. And then, of course, we compare these gobs of different studies, uh, superior versus anterior. That's always a question. Turns out in, in terms of, of comparison studies, really not a lot of clinical difference. The one big thing is there is less prominence and less hardware removal with the anterior plates probably a little less risk of plunging. So I like anterior plates. That's my go-to, but superior plates are perfectly fine. How about nails versus plates? Again, there's a lot of actually fairly large amount of comparison data. They have the uh, same functional results, but there is a little less refracture if you take hardware out with a nail versus a plate. Other than that, though, functional results are the same. So what that means to me is you've got a variety of options, all of which work pretty darn well. I like to position the patient supine, bringing the floral in from the opposite side as shown here. That keeps it out of the way and allows me to get sort of inland outlet views. For incisions, you can, you can do it uh, parallel to the clavicle uh, or perpendicular. This is probably a little more cosmetic. I, uh, I like to do it parallel. I used to spare the supraclavicular nerves. I don't do that anymore. I, I just tell the patient they're going to have a little numbness. So back to our patient, what did we choose? Um, because he was now three months out, I used osteotomies to create opposable surfaces. Most clavicles have oblique fracture lines that can be either opposed acutely or made to oppose if not acute uh, with a saw. So it is, I'm using a saw here uh, with cooling. I don't show the cooling, but to create opposable oblique surfaces, which we can then lag with some mini frag screws. And then I just use a regular old straight plate, nothing fancy. I contour it myself. And again, I like to put it anterior. That's just my preference. 
So here we are in the drop. This is the floor. You can see uh, clamping of the, again, these opposable surfaces. You don't have to make the clavicle perfect. Just get it to be well opposed. Lag screws, uh, a, a self-contoured plate. And, and here's a view of it on the sort of inlet view. How did he do? Uh, here is post-op on the left. Three months later, he was healed. He was already back kayaking and uh, discharged from care. So in general, these are pretty good patients post-operatively. I'll just close with a companion case just to show a different uh, mindset. Here's a 36-year-old. He's a cement worker, and he has more comminution, so he's a little bit of a higher predicted non-union rate. His key was he just didn't want to be off work for dollar reasons. So for him, his risk was time, not operative risk. So he chose uh, to have acute surgery, uh, and so we went ahead and fixed him acutely. Very sort of a similar type uh, approach. Again, an anterior plate. In this case, I use a little superior cheater plate as shown here, absolute stability construct, plate placed anteriorly, and he went on to heal and get back to work. We sent him back at six weeks to his work. So I think in summary, non-operative displaced clavicles, you want to remember at about a 15% on average non-union rate. If you can get the clavicle to heal, whether <clears throat> op or non-op, functional results are very similar. I think the wait and see method is quite reasonable for those that want to avoid surgery. And again, in our part of the country, that's what most people choose. And there's no one method of fixation that's proven far superior. All right. Thank you. Cliff Jones uh, talked about the proximal humerus. And um, I think the moral of the story first is don't operate on them. Um, but I'll go over a few that may benefit from that. Uh, I think the keys to success or patient selection is paramount concerning this. But I think the room set up imaging approach, reduction, implant insertion, and rehab for these patients. So if you look at the literature, uh, it is the majority non-operative treatment for these patients. I think you need to tailor uh, patient expectations, fractured pattern, and surgeon skill and experience concerning this. All these uh, two parts that are impacted, minimal angulation or some even with angulation do very, very well with non-operative management. I think the displaced greater tuberosity is still a little out in terms of which ones you should operate on or not. The displaced ones probably do better with surgery. The question is who and in what hands and what type of procedure from that. So again, non-operative majority of patients expect about 90 degrees of forward flexion. They all have pain for weeks after this with or without surgery. Surgery does not lessen their pain at all. Uh, and again, really tailor the patient surgeon abilities. I would say especially, but also I'd probably say the few alls or nuns, I hardly say that, but alcoholics, drugs, dementia, non-cooperative, stay away from any incisions on these patients. This is in a um, uh, older uh, female with a two-part type injury. You can see the angulation. Uh, Paul's just had a recent study in terms of that anterior translation component, but this lady is quite functional, very happy without surgical intervention. This is a three-part, uh, 90 degrees varus, and again, very, very functional and happy with the results uh, concerning this. Which ones do you want to fix with internal fixation or surgery? Younger compliant patients. Uh, with an unstable fracture pattern. In other words, it's translated. There's no impaction at the site. Um, and those patients may benefit from surgical uh, intervention. And again, though, expect the same outcome. About 100 degrees of forward flexion abduction. If you get better, it's great. And of course, as uh, Dave said in his earlier talk, you're going to have higher complications if you operate on these with mainly intraarticular screws, scarring, atrophy, avascular necrosis. The setup for me is usually a diving board type of um, uh, C-arm backwards, uh, reverse Trendelenburg component. I tuck the contralateral arm and the C-arm comes in perpendicular. And these are kind of the views that I get for the Grasher AP, rollover lateral. And then once you have some stabilization, the axillary view. Others have done with the C-arm coming from above for the Cephalad component also works very well. Just make sure that you get visualization if you're going to operate on these. If you can't get visualization, you're going to have problems intraoperably. This is in a uh, two-part. Um, I think is not going to do well. There's no impaction of this type injury. Uh, this treated with a proximal uh, humeral locking plate with a fibular strut. I have um, reserved that in very few patients. I'll use that on now. I think 
I, I try and avoid that. If you ever had a partner that you refer this to for a complication, they hate you for this because it takes a long time to get that fibular strut out to do any type of arthroplasty. So a 61-year-old active male, ipsilateral uh, dominant arm uh, with uh, no comorbidities. You can see the injury pattern and displacement. This is probably not going to do very well in this person, even though it's a little bit more of an impacted type injury. There was an apex anterior translation <clears throat> using joysticks to reduce the fracture um, very gently uh, without much other um, dissection, a preliminary uh, KY or terminally threaded chance pins to reduce the fracture, line your plate up. Uh, once you have it reduced from there, get it out of uh, valgus, get your plate in position on the bone. And I think it's very important when you do this that they have the um, uh, anterior and posterior screws, cephalad and uh, caudal. And these are probably the best to try and get your alpha or beta screws. If you ever use a proximal femoral plate, it's not used frequently. It's the same type of construct and, and concept where you really want to get your screws optimized in the head. This also will tell you if you have retroversion or anaversion of the head component also. And a really low kickstand type screws in the head. Final reduction without a fibular strut. And you can see the final long-term settled a little bit, uh, but healed up and did well. He had probably 120 degrees of forward flexion abduction, was quite happy the result from there. Posterior fracture dislocation. Um, as you can see from the injury here, uh, attempted close reduction times four was hinged out the back component. At least the head wasn't sheared off when they tried to do this. For me, this is a, a deltopectoral type of approach anteriorly. You want to take a look at the anterior tuberosity uh, from that. Uh, the C-arm, as you can see from here, the, the uh, injury components more anteriorly than uh, more posteriorly. I like to use a chance pin within the head to uh, translate, unhinge, and then bring the head back into the joint uh, as a nice reduction maneuver to keep the soft tissue components in position. If you have soft bone, use two chance pins within the head, kind of divergently in position to get the head reduced. That goes right through the tuberosity area where the tuberosity is off. Get the fracture reduced, then head screws in position, and then your a final plate position uh, from there. Anterior fracture dislocation, I, I think of it the other way because the Really, the money is that tuberosity component. So for me, I need to take a look and make sure the plate's posteriorly enough. I think you can still do this through a deltal pectoral. But I think it's easier from the uh, extended lateral position. Same thing, place the chance pins in the head to keep the head from dis being dislodged. Get the fracture reduced. It looks pretty good um, until about the six to eight week interval when the tuberosity came out, uh, came off from this. And you look back, the the plate seems to be posterior enough concerning that. Uh, the tuberosity component came off. This is uh, revised, not very fun to bring the tuberosity back in position to get the, the cuff to function from that because you'll have uh, pseudo paralysis from that. And then a hook plate in position to get that tuberosity fractured heel. She was seen by me probably uh, three or four weeks ago and probably had about 120 to 30 degrees, which I find to be a big win from this type of injury. Again, not normal function uh, or motion from that. Greater tuberosity fractures. Uh, again, I look at this through the extended acromial type of approach. I think the indications from these are quite varied concerning that. I think you can use screws uh, in position. I, I, again, like to use a hook plate type of to hold the soft tissues in position and to squeeze this, this in position so this does not displace. These fractures are usually more common than you think and usually poor bone quality. Lesser tuberosity. Uh, again, for me, this is an anterior delta pectoral approach. Uh, this is one that was a delayed pickup, had an osteotomy to bring tuberosity in position. Uh, and screw fixation from there. Hemiarthroplasty, I think, are for elderly patients, usually low demand. Um, I think this has also been used for younger patients with non-reconstructable heads, um, where you have the tuberosity that you can get to heal. There's unpredictable function, again, from this, usually minimal pain. This is in a patient that's an oddity, in my opinion. This lady did extremely well with a uh, 
uh, head split type injury with an ipsilateral shaft. This is the oddity, not the normality for these types of injuries in an in arthroplasty that went on to do very well. This is usually what you see concerning this in a, a patient with a complex injury, had a hemiarthroplasty with pseudo subluxation. The cuff is just not working at all and has pseudo paralysis. And that's where the reverse shoulder arthroplasties come in to do so well concerning that. Again, elderly patients with displaced fractures, head split and fracture dislocation. Um, I think the definition of younger continues to change concerning that. Um, I think people are doing these in people even in their 40s. I, I don't think we have long-term data of how these patients are going to do concerning that, but um, that, that is the trend concerning that. I'd have to say that you get predictable 120 degrees of motion uh, just because the lever arm component much different than uh, 100 degrees or less with the other type of procedures concerning that. And then just be careful on patients who need their arms for weight bearing using a walker and so forth from there. Uh, complex four-part head split injury. You can see the uh, reduction in arthroplasty from here. I see the problem though, you're coming to a trauma course um, and trauma people put in plates and screws. And uh, this is a probably a shoulder expert who does this type of thing. So if you're going to embark on this and or feel uncomfortable doing this, I would make sure you have a partner that knows how to do a reverse shoulders or to just refer them that initially here. I think patients that you fix and fail do much worse than if you didn't operate on them at all initially or they were sent to the proper surgeon to begin with. So just be careful of that. Again, another complex injury where the head's completely split a reverse arthroplasty or, or proximal replacement for this patient. So the keys to success, accurate imaging and diagnosis, very careful patient selection. I think this is the number one uh, for me. Biological friendly dissection. Reduction is paramount to get them out of varus and get the tuberosities back in position. Deliberate uh, placement of implants with long, low screws and cuff sutures tied to the plate and consider augmentation in some complex type of cases. So uh, as Dan said, you have this solved. Well, if you have this many implants for this fracture, that means we don't have this solved. And they have this many complications, which means many times it's dealer's choice concerning that. And I think I would err on non-operative management of these initially uh, versus uh, dialing in anything else uh, for these type of patients. Thank you. My uh, task is to talk about humeral diaphyseal fractures. Um, I do not have any disclosures. I think humeral shaft fractures, a lot of them, and like Dave said, where we live, a lot of people actually like to avoid surgery whenever possible. And so we actually treat a fair number of fractures uh, without surgery. I think that little circle of surgical indications has grown a little bit as we've gotten to be more uh, thoughtful about our recommendations for our patients. I wanted to take time and talk a little bit about non-operative treatment. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of non-operative treatment. I think it's actually something, it's hard. You have to actually get the patients and yourself to buy in, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, and usually most isolated patients actually start out on the pathway of non-operative treatment. Healing rates, as you know, are probably going to end up shaking out like clavicles. There's probably going to be about a 15% non-union rate, even though we were told when we were in our early training that it's like, hey, they heal almost all the time. Usually transition from a coaptation splint to a brace. And there are some things that don't work out early on and you should just get, stop trying to make it work. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. For functional bracing, I actually do take an interest in these patients. I actually see them weekly for the first three weeks just to make sure they're doing okay. They're not getting a skin sore. They have adequate resources at home to take a shower and take their brace off once in a while. Um, usually I tell them to do active protraction and retraction of their scapula. Uh, do some pendulum exercises and actually frequent wrist and elbow range of motion. So it's not a very passive treatment. It's actually a very active treatment early on. So you see these people a lot. This is one of my patients that uh, I happen to have my camera with, and uh, he fell snowboarding, 30-year-old guy, <clears throat> pretty healthy. He wore a brace for 10 weeks, and here's his x-rays at six months, and he had absolutely normal function. So I think like Dave said in the clavicles, if these heal and heal relatively straight, they actually do, they do well. Um, there's been quite a bit of information coming out on isolated fractures. We don't have the robustness of a lot of trials, uh, but these trials take a long time to accumulate patients. And these, one of the most seven years of getting patients, the second one was 10. But what we're finding out in, in randomized trials, we actually put people in the non-operative groups 
the non-union rate is pretty robust at you know 15 to 25 percent. So we're actually seeing you know patients that get into trials, they get assigned their treatment uh, uh, pathway, and they go from there. What we do know is that uh, one of the, the trials that came out in JAMA, JAMA publishes a lot of our randomized trials because they're actually so rare in orthopedics. They actually end up in a pretty uh, more widely read journal. Um, here they had 82 patients. They tried to split evenly between brace and plate. What they noted is 30% of the brace people converted over to surgery. Most of those were non-unions. But people that had surgery did have infections and uh, transient radial nerve pulses were not uncommon. That would actually, the radial nerve pulses are not uncommon in my practice either. Uh, all said and done, the two groups at the end of it all, their DAS scores were uh, very close. And like Dave said, a minim minim minimally important difference is about 10 points in a DAS score, and they were a lot narrower than that. So <clears throat> whether you need to get surgery to get to the uh, finish line or not, the, the patients did about the same. What they did most recently at the OTA, they presented uh, a group of patients from Canada. Again, it took them 10 years to accumulate these patients. They noticed, which is not a surprise, the patient reported outcomes were much better earlier on in their treatment course. But again, at one year, they did not seem to change. 15% converted from brace to surgery uh, because of uh, healing issues. Having said that, I think that this information helps us, just like Dave was trying to counsel his patient. Uh, the patient reported outcomes are better early. So they're very similar at one year. I think if you had someone who was a worker and had a lot of time off work, this would be a reasonable indication to do surgery on an isolated humerus fracture. Now, you need a rate with bracing. It's a solid 10 to 20%. And I think we can usually tell at about six to eight weeks that if there's callus and motion or callus and no motion, it's like you're probably going to have a win on your hands. If it's atrophic and no callus, I, I stop. I said, listen, we're probably not going to heal here. We should just move on to another thing. So I'm hoping we can actually make our judgments or recommendations for patients much more thoughtful than assigning them to a randomized trial. So hopefully the non-union rate will be a lot less. Transient radial nerve palsies are a reality. Uh, uh, infections, hopefully, are pretty rare in isolated cases, but they do occur. Again, we're going to get eventually to more shared decision-making like clavicles, and I think that we'll have a lot more uh, influence on our patients with our, our clinical judgment and our recommendations. But again, this is one we see a lot of people who like to avoid surgery. Um, oops, excuse me. Uh, I'll just show you some decision-making and action. I had these two patients show up in my office about the same time, about three months ago. Uh, one guy actually works at a company called Epic. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it or not, but it's one of our big employers in our area. He's actually from El Paso, Texas, and he played a lot of baseball when he was growing up. And now he's, he plays in a rec league, and he actually had antecedent arm pain for about a month or two before he was uh, pitching, and he pitching and had an a, a, a injury to his arm. Then the lady I have on the left, she's older. She actually doesn't get around too great, but she fell at home and had an isolated clavicle fracture. Um, goody, I operated on one of these. Which one do you think I operated on? Okay. Okay. So the 28 year old guy, he got, he got non, they both got non operative treatment to start out with. And, um, oops, keep going the wrong way. So he actually, I saw him every week for the first three weeks. Uh, he actually did pretty okay in a brace. He just added a desk at Epic and didn't have to do any really hard work. So he was, I would not call him a laborer. Here he's at three months. He was in his brace for 10 weeks. He's actually out of his brace. I'm not kidding. He looked normal. I mean, I was like shocked it's like how good he looked. So um, uh, he actually is doing well. I'm going to see him back one more time in six months. The other lady, she struggled. Uh, she had not bad Parkinsonism, but she had some low-level Parkinsonism. Because of her injury, she became wheelchair bound. And she was doing just crappy in a brace. I said, I just can't take it anymore. And neither could she. So she got converted to surgery three weeks after her injury. Uh, pretty straightforward surgery, absolute stability with a neutralization plate. And again, I did an anterolateral approach. Surprisingly, she had a transient radial nerve palsy. It lasted about four weeks, but it went away. And um, she's doing fine. So just, I think that both these patients, I was open-minded about what to do, but it kind of came as we kind of got to know each other uh, to how to treat them. So I think it's always important if you're going to start out on a brace and isolate injuries like I do most of the time, you got to know when to call it quits. Sometimes patients and doctors just can't handle it anymore. You just have to, you have to cut bait and move to surgery. I don't consider that a failure. That's just what the clinical scenario presents itself. If you have continued soft tissue problems uh, or you figure out, listen, this is not likely to heal, just give up on it early. Atrophic fractures, very mobile at two months is probably not going to happen. So I tell people we should move on to surgery. And we usually do. Now, we do have some very strong indications for operative treatment, open fractures, uh, severe uh, so soft tissue injuries. Uh, and usually ipsilateral uh, upper extremity injuries is a pretty solid indication for surgery. Some more relative indications when they're pretty banged up, mobilization is better. They have multiple other injuries. 
pathologic fractures. And like I said, uh, when, when is the time to call it quits? I think that's a relative indication as well. Um, again, a few absolute indications. Most are relative clinical judgments required. I have to make a few comments about radial nerve, nerve problems. They do not drive decisions to operate. I think that you may have some slight positive benefits from doing surgery on people, but that's not the reason we change uh, operative versus non-operative. So we're going to talk about exposures in the lab. I just want to introduce you to them. I've used all of these at one point or another. Um, I've actually gone a little bit more anterior lateral than posterior or posterior lateral. And I think it's just out of wanting to have the patient be in a supine position, but I use all of them. Interoperatively, when we do plating, which is what we do mostly for humerus fractures, they're often simple fractures, and we want to try to generate compression. So I want to spend time to tell you how to generate compression uh, in surgery. This is one of my patients who worked at a glass factory. He had a whole bunch of glass panes actually fall on him and knock him down. He actually hurt his arm a lot. He had a medial epicondyle fracture that was off and a humeral shaft fracture. To me, this is an easy indication for surgery. So my question is like, how can I generate compression during surgery? You'll see these small point of reduction clamps. I love these things. If you see some clinical photos in my case, case presentations, sometimes I should drill small holes in the cortex on either side, and I want to compress both medially and laterally, so I have four little pock marks in the bone, just enough to get those clamps in place. And uh, you can see them here after uh, there's one there. I think there's another one up and through here. But you can see that you can get tremendous compression uh, to help make this fracture uh, be an absolute stability for um, uh, good healing. Uh, this is one of my colleagues' uh, patients. This person had an ipsilateral both bone form fracture. And uh, so the indication was there for that. He decided to use interosseous wires, which I don't use too often, but this is a, just a, a great way to actually generate compression at the fracture site and minimize the soft tissue trauma. So we actually put the interosseous wire across, tightened it, got it perfectly reduced, then took the wire out when he was done after he gained more compression with his plate. So just another way to achieve you know, inter interosseous compression interoperatively. This is a patient that came to me after, after having had her humerus fracture nailed for 17, 17 years ago. She had had a non-union for that long and had significant disability. So this is one where I actually wanted to generate intraoperative compression. I just trimmed off the fracture ends and used a verbruge clamp. This is a cheap person's um, articulated, compre uh, articulated compression device. And so you just have an anchoring screw, use a verbruge, generate compression, and uh, there you go. Here she is intraoperatively. Post-op in a year, she healed well. Her biggest complaint? shoulder pain by far and away. So um, anyways, um, this is just a person a little more comminuted. You might think you couldn't get interosseous compression, but with a combination of lag screws and mini plates, it's definitely possible. Get a neutralization plate over the top. Um, so sometimes uh, I actually want to do absolute stability and uh, uh, interosseous compression, and sometimes it kind of runs out of gas. This one has, this guy was actually coaching his mom's adult women's hockey team. He's about 25 or so. He's skating backwards and took a digger on the ice and had an interarticular distal humerus fracture, which is a little more sneaky than you think, and then a diaphyseal component. But what happened is when I was in the process of putting the joint together, that was pretty easy, but I'm like, I'm going to try to lag all these things together. Well, you know what? I had all these clamps on and things started to fall apart big time. So I'm like, all right, I'm switching gears here. I'm just going to do a bridge plate. It'll work out fine. And you can see this is what ended up happening. I got the fracture somewhat close, a bridge plate, and he healed with, uh, with callus. Uh, I just want to mention briefly plates versus nails. Uh, uh, I think that most, most of us actually favor uh, plates. I'll just speak for myself. I do use nails occasionally, but the indications have to be there for it. I think in comparing them together, I think the results have gotten closer over the years. I think the healing rates are similar. We definitely have more complication with nails. A lot of them deal with the shoulder. And I think that the, um, uh, the range is probably not quite as great with the nails as the plate. You can't go distal with a nail. So I think the best indications for a plate that, uh, over a nail are non-unions, revisions, simple fractures, and distal extension. So just be careful with your exposures. When does a nail actually have some attractiveness to it? Segmental fractures, pathologic fractures, type B and C fractures, which are more common to an osteoporotic bone. Um, here's a uh, patient of mine that actually had a bad, bad uh, fireworks accident on his um, bachelor party night, severe soft tissue trauma, and we actually decided to do a nail and heal just fine. So to view the indications for surgical treatment, we have few relative or few absolute, and most of them are relative. Um, I think for isolated injuries, this is one of the ones that's going to be a long clinic visit and a lot of time with your patient if you're going to treat them successfully without surgery. Think about reduction techniques if you're going to do surgery to make sure your fractures are reduced as best they can be. Uh, we talked about plate nail. Uh, 
And we're going to continue our discussions in the lab going over surgical exposures. Thank you very much. So we're going to focus primarily on technical aspects. This is sort of how to, not when to. I think most of these obviously need surgery, their articular injuries. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to achieve some success when you're fixing them. So the goals are, number one, understanding a really accurate diagnosis with a good preoperative plan certainly goes without saying. Try and figure out how you're going to choose and execute the appropriate surgical approach because, as Dan mentioned, there are options there, and I think it's important to start with the right uh, tactic, um, leaving yourself options, and, of course, then focusing on some reduction and fixation strategies, which get a lot of attention. So when it comes to diagnosis, really, you can break it down into its basic elements. You're going to have articular splits, right? These are intra-articular injuries, and you have to look for both the sagittal splits, which are obvious sometimes, and maybe the coronal splits, which are a little bit less obvious. Then you have to decide whether the condyles are disrupted, medial condyle, lateral condyle, or perhaps both. Understanding, of course, the comminution, the fragment size. This often comes down to whether or not you're even going to fix it versus arthroplasty. And of course, bone quality goes into that discussion as well. So it's important to think about all those features as you're looking at it. And of course, it begins and in some ways ends with the plain film, right? This is your average ER plain film of somebody with a distal humerus fracture. And again, if I were to go through the mundane task of asking everybody to pull out some tracing paper and try and figure out all of the different aspects of this, I don't think anybody would complete it successfully. And so you ask yourself, what's your next best intervention? That's the traction view, right? This is so far more valuable than a CT scan. And you may say, well, I don't have resonance. It's not that easy. Well, the bottom line is you can do it in the operating room before you put the patient in the position to operate, knowing that you have the options and the ability to maybe change your tactic a little bit. But I think the traction view is invaluable because now with that jumble of bones, I can clearly see that there's a relatively simple articular split in the sagittal plane. I can see that the condyles are both disrupted. I can get a sense that the lateral condyle is maybe a little bit less comminuted. But again, I can start to piece together the ideas of what it's going to mean to fix this fracture. The CT scan, like I said, it's far more limited in its utility around the elbow than other joints, mostly because it's never going to orient in the exact plane of all of the problem, right? And so given that you're having a lot of difficulty with out-of-plane orientation, you can gain data, but it's going to be limited. I tend to use it in older patients, again, to understand just how distal is that fracture, what is the bone quality, how comminuted is it, and in large part, that'll drive the decision towards replacement versus fixation. Um, I, it'll definitely allow you an easier time of seeing coronal splits. We can see here a little bit of capitellum that's way out of place. You can see here the associated injuries. Maybe there's a radial neck fracture that you didn't appreciate. Again, a coronal split in the capitellum. So it has its role, but it's far more limited than other joints. And so you shouldn't immediately assume that the CT scan is the be-all and end-all. The traction view is my buddy. The CT scan with a 3D rendering, I think, is far more useful in many of these injuries. This is obviously not the greatest rendering. Sometimes it looks like a beehive that everything's returning home to. And it's best if you can get the radiologist to sometimes remove the ulna and the radius to help you. So moving on to surgical approaches, really the workhorse approaches or the posterior approaches for the articular distal humerus, and we're going to show some exceptions. But really, it comes down to how do you manage the extensor muscle mass, the extensor mechanism, right? So the easiest way, and certainly the biggest way, is the transalecranon, the olecranon osteotomy. But again, you can also go on either side of the olecranon. We're going to show the paratricipital. You can do a tricep slide, which becomes essential if you want to leave the option for doing an elbow replacement, or in very, very rare instances for extra articular fractures, you can split the triceps. It's going to give you a very limited approach. So like I said, the olecranon osteotomy really is the, the be-all and end-all of, of the extensile approaches, right? You can get to almost every one of these with the exception of the anterior coronal shear. So if you've got a coronal shear fracture, you don't, don't want to do a posterior approach. You don't want to do an olecranon osteotomy. But virtually any of these other fractures can be approached with an olecranon osteotomy. So that's the only one you need to shy away from. But again, it's a lot of surgery that sometimes some people may not need. Clearly, there's a lot of attention to how you do the osteotomy because uh, you want to make sure that the cut you made in the bone is going to heal. This is looking at a patient from above, a specimen from above, and this is the arm hanging over the end of the table. So it's a chevron-shaped osteotomy, mostly because that gives you an intrinsic stability when you key it back together. You want to start it with an oscillating saw. You want to cool the blade so you prevent thermal necrosis. And ultimately, you'd like to finish the last little bit with an osteotome so that it cracks and gets that irregular surface that's going to, again, allow you some interdigitation for a more accurate reduction. 
Okay. So again, repairing the osteotomy, you're going to see a lot of different ways that people have advocated over the years. Um, back in, there was a time when people advocated for a single 6.5 screw or maybe a 4.5 screw. If you look closely at it, the non-union rate is much lower if you augment it with a tension band wire. The biggest challenge that I've had, and I used to do this with the screw, is just like nailing any fracture where the starting point is close to the fracture itself, the starting point becomes essential to prevent malreduction. And so you can see the screw looks a little bit bent. It is. If you're going to do this, you want to pre-drill it before you do the osteotomy. That helps you sort of isolate and find that starting point centered over the canal and maybe ream it out just a little bit extra with your drill so that it's a more central starting point over the canal so you don't malreduce when you're fixing it. Um, people used to use the standard old tension band wire, and there was concerns about wire migration and failure. Jesse Jupiter and uh, David Ring years ago had a really convincing paper that looked specifically at this double tension band technique with osteotomies with a very, very low incidence of non-union. This is my go-to in a lot of patients um, because it's simple and it's easy and it's going to be effective. The downside, of course, is that these wires can be a, a bit symptomatic if you're not careful where you put the knots and how much they stick up off the end. And so a lot of folks, again, will use plates now. And a plate may be a little bit of overkill. People argue that they're expensive, but at the end of the day, if it prevents a non-union, that's great. Again, another tip, if you're going to use a plate, is to at least put two screw holes drilled before you do the osteotomy. But again, you have to be careful because you can see closely here, you can still see the osteotomy. So if I were to put this plate in and pre-drill all of those holes and apply all the screws, the kerf of the blade will unfortunately, meaning the thickness that it removes, will remove a little bit of bone there. You want to be able to make sure that you can compress the plate that I use for this is the one you see here. It's a non-locking plate. So that screw that crosses the fracture site is a lag screw. Again, I think that's imperative so that you're not sort of leaving a gapped non-union maker with a rigid locking plate. Paratricipital, again, is a really, really helpful approach that's not quite as extensile as the Olecranon osteotomy. And so for me, that's all the extra articular A2 and A3s. I can easily get to those with a paratricipital where I don't need to do an osteotomy. I'll stay away from the Bs again for the most part, unless it's an isolated condyle that I feel the need to go posterior. Um, but the Cs, I'll, I'll do this, the C1s and the occasional C2. I stay away from doing the C3s with a paratricipital simply because I don't feel confident that I can get the intraarticular reduction. But again, a paratricipital is really, really effective, but it's harder. And so if you're somebody that's on a learning curve with these, I would start out with the electron on osteotomy for the increased exposure. And then maybe as you get more adept at reduction and fixation and you're willing to sort of struggle a little bit more seeing into the joint, move on to the paratricipital. And again, here it's relatively straightforward. You can see it in the lab, but basically you're just working on either side of the triceps making capsulotomies, right? You want to obviously isolate the ulnar nerve anytime you're working around the elbow. You make your capsulotomies, you come across the either side and across the back, and there you are. So here you can see again a clinical photo, and you can see for orientation that the, you know, here's your ulnar nerve on the medial side. You can sweep the whole extensor mass medially, and you can sweep it laterally rather, and you can sweep it medially, and you can see around it. I don't do this because I don't do uh, arthroplasty. I have partners who are far more adept at it. So I always make the decision pre-op, whether it's going to be replacement or fixation. But again, if you're on the fence, if you're somebody that uh, does both operations, clearly you're going to do some form of tricep sparing approach if, if you are going to try fixation, but you want to leave the option for an elbow replacement. So the only exception to all that is when you need to go anterior. And that really is primarily the B types. Then we'll show an example of one in a minute, the sort of the B3 that may sometimes extend across the front of the joint. And that's the value of the extended Kaplan approach that we're going to see in the lab. And that's something that's done, the exception here, that's done in the supine position. So again, here's a good example of one that's a lot more than just the capitellum. Again, I think Jesse Jupiter and David Ring had a real good series of these many years ago that sort of drew attention to this difficult pattern and the extended Kaplan approach, which really just takes the entire extensor mass off the, the lateral aspect of the epicondyle there, the lateral condyle. Um, allows you to, to see all the way across the front of the joint. You can see it right here. We're going to do it in the lab, but you can see all the way across the front of the articular surface. So reduction strategies, right? This is where the hard work begins. This is a great case I love to show. This is a 38-year-old urologist. He's an academic surgeon who commuted, I would hope that it's past tense, on one of those stand-up electric scooters. And he came up upon a, a, a pothole in downtown Philadelphia and thought he could jump it like Evil Knievel. I can't imagine a more insane way to, to, to commute, but there you have it. 
38 year old attending surgeon. I show this to the residents that have the commute with those things and I ask them to add up how many millions of dollars that's worth potentially, right? Think about that. Anyway, enough about him. So trying to fix that, you look at that and you go, oh shit, that, that is truly a mess, right? And so it begins with the traction film. So with the traction film, we're going to walk through this case because I think there's a lot to glean from it going step by step. So I look at the traction film and there's a few key features that I'm always going to look for. Certainly, I'm going to look in the articular central area to see if I can identify some comminution. This doesn't look quite right to me and I'm concerned about it. I'm not sure whether this is extra articular cortical edge of bone or whether it's articular. It's probably articular. That's probably the, the um, central part of the olecranon, I mean, of the uh, trochlea. I look over on the medial side and one of my biggest fears is that there's a separation between the medial epicondyle and the trochlea, because that's going to make it a lot harder. And this doesn't look right to me. So I'm convinced that yes, there is a disruption there. And I'm trying to decide, okay, which of these condylar disruptions is least comminuted? And that's my friend right here. The lateral condyle looks like a big piece that's not really comminuted, but I can start to break it down into its essential elements really simply with that, that attraction film. So I take him to the operating room. I did a trans on osteotomy. I'm not going to try and struggle with this one by saving his olecranon. So I get him positioned. He's in a, a, for me, it's a lateral position. You have to do them either lateral or prone. Um, it's just no other way to do it. Um, there is a rare exception, but we don't want to get into that. Um, but basically, this is starting to piece it together. So now, again, I've identified, again, flip your image, because now that we're looking at a C-arm with him lateral position, we've gone over to the inside here, the medial side. So here's that medial disruption between the trochlea and the medial epicondyle. Um, I've got my lateral condyle, which is a nice big piece, and I'm starting to look at the articular area. And this is, again, that central part. There was a piece that came off the, the central part of the trochlea, sort of going over towards the capitellum. And again, I'm starting with the joint. But for years, I was taught just start with the joint and hang the joint onto the humerus. That's not going to work. All the fracture lines have to line up. And so basically, it's like going around the horn in baseball. And you're just going to keep going around the infield until you finally get every reduction done correctly. And you obviously start with the simplest reduction, but you have to keep going around the horn. You can manipulate the larger fragments with these larger sticks. These are the two five shant screws that I find to be really helpful as joysticks. And they just start piecing together all the littler pieces. And so again, I go to the condyles and I realize that my lateral condyle was a nice big piece with an easy read. I love these little, um, the little um, mini fragment plates because it replaces the clamps. Sure, you can use, like Jerry showed, all the clamps that you can drill little holes and that's really effective to get your reduction, but to start holding it in place, I'll start replacing those with the mini fragment plates with very small screws. And again, as I go around the horn, you realize that all of the reductions were getting better and better. So now my articular reduction truly looks anatomic. I can see here that the reduction between the trochlea and the medial epicondyle is now anatomic. And so it all fits together. It's truly like a jigsaw puzzle that if you don't have the border pieces all put together correctly, it's not going to work. And so you've just got to keep working around the horn. So now that I've got my, my preliminary provisional fixation, now it's time to add the definitive fixation. And I hear people argue back and forth and talk about, you know, do you use 90, 90 plates? Do you use two plates that are at, 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 that, that are parallel, none of that matters. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the reason that two plates evolved was because with one plate, you didn't have enough torsional stability. So way back in the old, old days, when I was learning, we were using very malleable plates, right? And the malleable plates were put at 90 degrees to each other because that when you're using malleable plates, that generates more torsional stability in the construct. But the modern plates aren't one-third tubulars. They're not regular recon plates. They're not as malleable as they used to be. And so it really doesn't matter where your plates are positioned, you're going to have enough stability. The real value of the work that was done at the Mayo Clinic, in my opinion, with the parallel plates, was understanding the, the value of those screws that crossed from one column to the other. So what you see here now is fixation, again, based on this idea of screws coming from both sides, where they cross in the middle and they complete the horn, they complete the circle and the arch that generates so much stability in that periarticular zone. So there was a lot of value that came from understanding the, the utility of the parallel plates. But of course here, I use a plate that's 90-90 that has a little extension tab to give me those screws 
that go from lateral to medial. And honestly, I don't think it matters where your plates are. As long as your screws cross, cross both columns and you've got enough implant fixation above and below, those plates are not going to break. Um, unless, of course, you get a delayed non-union. But at the end of the day, I just think it's one of those discussion points that really is moot because both will work just fine. So again, here we've corrected the osteotomy. Um, we've got everything lined up. He fortunately got back to a very active practice. But you know, you, you sweat it out when when you when you see that um, admission X-ray. So I just wanted to briefly touch on one that is, again, the anterior approach. This is one that you have to do the extended Kaplan approach. And so your whole mindset is a little bit different. This is a B-type injury. It's a partial articular injury. This is one of those fractures, just like I showed the diagram, only it's a little more comminuted. This is an older woman who'd already had a radial head injury, obviously at a different time. Um, but in part because of the disuse of her arm, she had enough osteopenia on top of her age-based osteopenia that she had this kind of ugly looking B-type fracture. And so again, B-type fractures get B-type plates, they get buttress plates. And simply because there isn't a pre-made plate for it doesn't mean that that's not what you use. You get your 3D CT and you realize it helps you a little bit. I can see how far across the joint the fracture goes. I can see it does go to the anterior edge of the trochlea, just like that x-ray, that I mean, that uh, diagram that I showed from the uh, Ring and Jupiter paper. And so again, I try and reduce the articular surface through the extended Kaplan approach. And I put buttress plates because it's sort of a, a two column uh, or I guess two um, directions of force I want to apply. I get one plate in the front that sort of sits down as a buttress along the anterior leading edge of that fragment and along the, the lateral column is another buttress plate. And so lag screws and buttress plates, you don't see the lag screws here because I use bioabsorbable um, K wires. I don't know if everybody's used those. I, I think if I'm not mistaken, Roy Sanders had a neat little technical tip on when you use the ones from Arthrex that you pre-drill, they're not ones you tap in like a peg, you, you drill them in there. And, but the cool thing is you, you use the, um, the ophthalmology bovie, the battery powered bovie to cut them off. I don't know. I, I, I know a lot of the, the faculty have seen that. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but it's a really nice way to provide fixation of intraarticular fragments without, say, a headless compression screw. The problem with a headless compression screw in this bone is it's like trying to put a screw through a potato chip, right? And it's going to crumble. But I think those, those little um, absorbable K wires are really effective. So anyway, buttress plates are the best thing for a B-type fracture. So that's kind of the cases that I wanted to run through. And again, it all comes down to having a good understanding of the injury with a sound plan, figuring your surgical exposure, build the reduction sequentially. It's got to be right. It just takes time. You got to go around the horn. Use your provisional fixation in a way that helps you. Try and use mini frag screws, lag screws, and then the definitive fixation and rehab. Thanks. Get a little further down the arm now uh, into uh, elbow fracture dislocations, which certainly can involve the distal humerus, but to not be uh, repetitive, we'll just kind of focus a little further down. All right. So this is a, a case, uh, I think this is probably about two or three years ago now, polytrauma patient had a femoral neck and open pelvis, all these other things, and then wakes up a couple of days in the hospital complaining of severe elbow pain. Of course, he had, you know, IVs in that arm as well. And these are the x-rays that we got uh, that show kind of a complex elbow fracture dislocation pattern. The hope is that by the end of this, you'll kind of be able to look at something like this, analyze it and have a, uh, a good plan uh, going forward. So key points when you're dealing with elbow fracture dislocations are to review the anatomy and the approaches. These are not things that we do all the time, depending on your practice setting. Uh, you want to restore articular congruity and joint stability. So you have to think about the bony fragments as well as the ligamentous issues here. And then you want to start early active assisted range of motion, passive range of motion where uh, a therapist may be passively moving a patient's elbow has led me to get burned in these situations. So you want active assist where the patient is kind of controlling that situation a little more. So there are three bones, as we all know, but the, the three joints and the third one that seems to get forgotten a lot is the proximal radial ulnar joint. So if you, and, and you know, I, I tell my trainees this all the time, look at the three bones individually and look at the three joints individually. And if you really critically look at all those things on your x-rays, then you're going to be able to have a good plan of how to, uh, how to fix the elbow and make it stable. So with uh, the bare area was, was mentioned earlier, and uh, when you're looking at the lateral x-ray, it's important to remember the relationships of the coronoid process and the electron tip. So your coronoid should be 
at about the level of your radial head on the lateral view. And it's usually about twice as high as your olecranon tip. So just remembering kind of the general shape of the elbow. And, and these are cases and really all complex articular fractures are cases where having contralateral films can be helpful as part of your pre-op planning. And certainly in complex elbows, it's, it's pretty easy to do just getting a couple of fluoro images before you prep and drape. So the main ligamentous structures that we worry about on the medial side is the anterior band or anterior bundle, and particularly the anterior band of that anterior bundle of the uh, medial collateral ligament, which goes from the medial epicondyle to the sublime tubercle. And then on the lateral side is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which I remember as a junior resident, I had no idea what that actually meant until going in the lab and, and looking at it, even though it's called the ulnar collateral ligament, it's on the lateral side, starts at the lateral epicondyle, goes behind your radial head onto the proximal ulna at the supernator crest. So the workhorse approach for me on the lateral side of the elbow is the Kaplan approach, right? There is the, uh, the, the option of the Coker approach, which is a little more posterior, but the Kaplan allows you to do an arthrotomy and come across the front of the elbow joint and, and not disrupt the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, unless it's already in a fracture dislocation where it's disrupted, then you can take advantage of that tear. But if you're doing a radial head fracture or something where it's intact and you don't want to necessarily disrupt it, and you can extend this arthrotomy way further than is in this diagram and really see across the front of the elbow. So when do you go medial? Uh, the times that I go medial is if I have to plate the coronoid fracture that I can't access uh, laterally, or if I have to repair or reconstruct the MCL, I don't really do ulnar nerve transposition, but that would be another possible indication of, of going medial. So there's two ways to get to the medial side. You can go through your flexor pronator mass or you can uh, start on bone and stay on bone and work from, uh, from posterior to anterior. But there you want to be careful uh, on either approach. You want to identify the ulnar nerve and protect it. And if you're staying, starting on bone and working your way anterior, you don't want to release the MCL as you're, as you're uh, dissecting. So we'll go through a couple different fracture patterns and then work our way up from simple to complex as far as dislocations. Uh, but olecranon fractures, there's a whole bunch of criteria uh, for uh, the different classifications. I don't really know any of them. Uh, the things that you want to worry about are, is the extensor mechanism disrupted and is there articular incongruity? If it's a young, healthy patient, that means surgery. There are some uh, good series out there for elderly and firm patients, even with these criteria that you can certainly treat them non-operatively, but in the young, healthy patients, if they have these issues, you're going to fix them. And as far as options, there are several out there. You saw a bunch of different ways to fix olecranons in the last talk. I won't go through them all. My preferred method is plating with a low profile, well-positioned plate. And if you look critically at the literature, uh, that has the lowest hardware irritation and implant removal uh, is with plating. So here's an example of an olecranon fracture uh, that has a little bit of comminution, is a little bit distal to the center of rotation. And so it's one that I chose to plate. And uh, so most companies now have pre-contoured plates. You can certainly make your own. I like to split the triceps centrally. That allows you to get the plate down to bone and then close the triceps over the head of the plate again. Again, not excited, not elevating the triceps off the electron at all, but just splitting it, getting the plate down to bone, closing it. And then it leads to even less hardware irritation at the tip of the elbow. In fact, the rare plate that I've had to take out is if I've used a long plate and they're more irritated further down, further down the forearm. Uh, the other thing to do is in certainly in poor quality bone, it's uh, been published in JOT and is a nice technical trip trick to uh, run a heavy non-absorbable suture in a running locking uh, way up and down the triceps, then tie that to your plate to enhance your stability. So moving down to uh, coronoid fractures, uh, you know, there's different types that, uh, that are Driscoll modified uh, with focus on the anteromedial facet for elbow stability. And so these rarely occur in isolation, uh, but if you do have a, a one that's in isolation, uh, you can potentially treat them non-operatively. But if they're usually as part of a constellation of injuries, you're, you're typically going to fix them. Uh, and uh, uh, your options are as listed here. If you have a big fracture at the base, you can fix it with a, with a P to A screw, but usually uh, these require uh, uh, suture fixation as they're typically small fragments. So radial head fractures, uh, 
they're either going to be non-displaced with no block to rotation. If they're in isolation, you can treat them non-operatively. If it's displaced and it's and it's possible to fix it with a simple fracture pattern, you can certainly fix them. Or but or if they're uh, severely comminuted, then it's pretty rare that you're just going to do an excision of the entire radial head. Usually, that uh, we tend to repair those, especially in a fracture dislocation situation. But if you're going to fix them, where do you fix them? Well, usually with the forearm in neutral rotation, if you're working through the lateral approach, you can. it's the, the face of the radial head that you are directly staring at will be a safe spot because you want to avoid the proximal radial ulnar joint. You don't want the implants to impinge on that joint and limit uh, forearm pronosupination. If you're going to replace them, you have a variety of different implants out there. The pendulum goes back and forth on this as far as what you choose. Uh, my choices are kind of underlined there, uh, press fit, modular, and unipolar, but certainly there's a big push to going back towards a loose fit. But even that with early results, there's some issues with lucency again. Uh, the key thing is to avoid overstuffing. What that means is, is not only people always focus on the AP view, and uh, I'm not sure does this is, uh, arrow show up, looking at the symmetry of the ulna humeral joint to make sure that it's not wider uh, laterally than medially, but also on the lateral view. You want to make sure that you can fully flex and fully extend without the radial head wanting to dislocate posteriorly. So here's an example of a, of a radial head slash neck fracture that's minimally displaced that also has to happens to have a distal third radial shaft fracture. So it's one that we wanted to address surgically, and it was a simple pattern that we with good bone quality that we were able to fix. But had that not been the case, you always want to go into these. If you're thinking about fixing, have the replacement available in the OR and sterile. And that was the final fixation for this one. Uh, moving on up the ladder now, going to fracture dislocations. Uh, the terrible triad is the one that's probably the most well-known in, in the literature and the most feared uh, one that we see. It's primarily an elbow dislocation. So you have a dislocation of the ulna humeral joint, dislocation of the radiocapitellar joint, but the radius and the ulna went together. It, it's typically the proximal radial ulnar joint is typically intact. There is an associated coronoid fracture and an associated radial head fracture. So you have to address those three things, the elbow dislocation, the coronoid, and the radial head. Now, as far as how we treat them, uh, this is, uh, you know, the you, you typically do a lateral approach to start and then work your way from medial to lateral. So you start with the coronoid, work your way back to the radial head, and then st uh, and then end with the uh, lateral collateral ligament. In the vast majority of these cases, you're done. On rare occasion, if you still have residual medial instability, then you can go medial and repair the MCL or you can do either a static or a hinged X fix, or you can use alternative implants, which are, are newer and, and available now that, uh, that I think obviate those last two, two steps. So here's a variant of a terrible triad injury. You've got uh, an elbow dislocation. Uh, you've got a coronoid fracture, a radial head fracture. This one also happens to have a, a proximal ulnar shaft fracture. Uh, 3D CT can be helpful in some of these as well, as mentioned for the distal humerus. So the 3D, the 2D really doesn't help too much, but the 3D can be helpful and shows you all those components of this injury. So this is how it was addressed. We did uh, we did a uh, uh, large posterior incision flapped over to the Kaplan interval, which in the upper extremity is much more forgiving with doing that than the lower extremity. Took out the radial head, fixed the coronoid, then replaced the radial head, then fixed the lateral and collateral ligament on the way out and uh, ended up with a stable elbow. So moving on to trans fracture dislocations. So this is a pattern where, again, just looking at the bones and then looking at the joints, right? So you have uh, the radial heads dislocated, the ulna humeral joints dislocated, but the radius and the ulna stayed together. So the proximal radial ulnar joint's intact on this one. This may or may not have an associated radial head fracture. And these are typically anterior from a, a fall with the direct blow onto the back of the forearm. So this is that same case. And typically, if you reduce the olecranon component, the radial head will follow uh, because the proximal radial ulnar joint's intact. Uh, I think you've seen a lot of talks the last days of using mini fragment Im implants for part of constructs. They make things easier, making many fragments into few. And then the definitive fixation here was with a pre-contoured plate. And then moving on to Montagia variants, again, just looking at the bones, looking at the joints. This is a case where the radio, 
uh, ulnar joint is disrupted. So the radius and the ulna did not go together, right? So just keeping things simple, looking at each joint, each bone, and these may or may not involve a radial head fracture. So this is that case with, you know, the, the radio capitellar, radio capitellar and proximal radial ulnar joints dislocated, a proximal third ulna fracture. And again, um, reducing the ulna, getting it anatomic, ensuring that the radio capitellar joints now reduced at the end. And uh, that's our final fixation construct. So post-op, these are kind of individualized. If I'm very, if, if it's an isolated fracture or I'm really confident in my ligamentous fixation, I'll let them start moving right away. But occasionally I'll splint them for a couple of weeks if I'm a little more unsure. And then when you start your rehab protocol, it's active assist range of motion. I protect their weight bearing uh, for eight to 12 weeks, pro progressive lifting allowance. And then uh, I don't typically do any HO prophylaxis on these patients, but you can talk to your faculty about that. Uh, so this is revisiting the first case again, the guy that, you know, we, we discovered his uh, elbow fracture dislocation a few days after admission. So we took him, we did the lateral Kaplan approach. It was a really small radial head fragment. So we excised it. The majority of the radial head was intact. We repaired the coronoid through uh, uh, suture repair through uh, uh, drill tunnels and then repaired the lateral ulnar collateral ligament on the way out. I like testing elbow stability with fluoro, saving a bunch of shots, pronation, supination, flexion, extension, just to prove to myself radiographically and staring at the arm that it's stable. So here was post-op. Six weeks out, he's in our rehab facility and uh, says, hey, my elbow's hurting. Let's get an x-ray. So here he is now. Now what do we do, right? So he's still got the same issues. Uh, the tissues are probably torn up a little bit. So we take him to the OR, uh, decide to revise him, see what we can do. We open him up. Uh, there's not really great tissue to repair, but we can get them reduced. So we bailed out to this uh, this new implant that's essentially acting like an X-fix, but it's internal. Um, and uh, we're able to salvage kind of a, a bad situation. I've gone to using this acutely now in some situations where I'm not sure about my ligamentous repair. Rather than going medial, I'll put this on the lateral side. And so this was how we were able to, to salvage his elbow. Here he is at eight months. These are technically supposed to be removed. I've got a lot of them floating out there now that patients refuse to have them taken out. Uh, but this guy, I was able to convince him to, uh, to let me take it out. And here he is at the time of removal. And there's his range of motion, which ended up, wound up pretty good. Um, and then, you know, here he is at 11 months. The concern with these and the reason That's people recommend. Ask, when are you <laughs> taking them out? When, so when? I usually take them out at six months. Um, this one though, here he is at 11 months, three months after removal. And the reason people recommend to take him out is that, you know, you kind of have that loose, smooth pin that's rotating in the humerus and, and you can, uh, that's, that's concerning with that area of lucency there. So just like to point out the on label use or removal is six, six weeks, but I don't know of anyone who does that. I don't think anybody does them that early. Yeah. <laughs> that would, that would be nuts in my opinion. So potential complications with elbow fracture dislocations, you can see the list. There's a ton of them. The one that I tell all these patients universally is you're going to be stiff. You will never be able to fully straighten your elbow again or fully flex your elbow again. But our goal is to get you able to do most activities of daily living. And that's that. So if nothing else, remember to review the bony anatomy and the joint anatomy and try to get a stable elbow so you can start early active assist range of motion. Thank you. Hey, Hassan, do you, know, do you know what you guys pay for that little widget? Because someone told me in our institution and I almost threw up. Uh, we pay a lot. I don't know the exact number, but that's why I use it maybe a handful of times a year. It's cheaper than a uh, hinged x sticks, I can tell you that. It is actually cheaper than the old compass hinge, and it, it's a million times easier to put on. The old compass hinge was not fun to put on. Even, even cheaper is this a trans... Uh... Owner, a trans electron screw for like a twenty-five dollars. It is or less. Twelve bucks. Leave it in three weeks. Take take it take it out three weeks. So Tracy, this is a really good point because I've done this. When you do that, do you make sure it's sticking out the posterior cortex? So when the you idiot, have to leave it long, yeah, and you have to you have to cast them because it'll it'll break. But if they do break, you you've left it long so you can take it out from behind those, those and from great. below. You guys, Kathy Kramer reported that with you guys yes, what, twenty-five ago. years ago. Uh, yeah, close to works great. Still, still the same screw 25 years later, still works. Same screw. Yeah. The other thing I've gone to doing way more often than the hinge now is, um, if the ligament repair is not, if I'm not confident in it, I'll use, uh, some sort of heavy non-absorbable suture tape. 
and anchors on either side to basically make a false ligament and, uh, and then tie in the residual tissue there. And, and that usually creates enough stability that I don't have to go to one of the, one of those internal hinges. Question here. Yeah. HO, if you delay surgery on a shovel tray in five, seven days, is that going to increase the rate, rate of uh, HO? I'm not aware of any literature that says time to surgery increases your risk of HO, but uh, I, certainly if it's within a week, I don't think you're increasing your risk of HO uh, by waiting within a week. Now, maybe if you wait a lot longer, it probably increases and just makes your, your likelihood of getting a good ligamentous repair uh, less likely. But I don't think if you get to it within a week, it's, it's increasing your risk of HO. So uh, nothing uh, pertinent to uh, this talk and my disclosures. Here's your objectives. Uh, just recognize that the forum is uh, and unique in that it's a Two big long diaphyseal bones, but you got to treat them like a joint. Okay, you got to treat like a joint fracture. You usually try to go for anatomic reduction. We're gonna look at some specific fracture patterns. Look at things that can complicate management of your open, of your forearm fracture. Review the surgical approaches and fixation techniques. So, like I said, this is uh, two bones that constitute five joints. So you've got three in the elbow and two in the wrist, and you got one big long interosseous membrane that uh, tethers the two bones together. So anatomic restoration is imperative here so that the bones can actually work with each other. Obviously, uh, you want to try to find uh, the two bones back to the anatomic position. They are not straight bones. The only is a post, and it's fairly straight, but it does have proximal angulation that you need to take into account. And when fractures occur in that proximal ulna, they're probably something you need to fix. So there's your center of rotations. It goes from the ulnar styloid to the middle of the radial head. And the ulna acts like a post and the radius rotates around it. Okay, so for restoration of normal function of the forearm, they have to be anatomically aligned. Otherwise, you're going to wind up restricting uh, some form of motion, usually in the supination and pronation arc. So evaluation, you need to document a neurovascular exam. There are four nerves across, in, across the elbow into the forearm, median ulnar, uh, superficial radial and pin nerve. And those have to be examined and assessed before you take on the fractures in that region. Open fractures, uh, pretty common, and uh, they increase your risk of complications, all those there, infection, non-union, loss of fixation, and loss of function. Really, the loss of function is mostly related to the soft tissue damage. So the more damage you have to the motor units, the more loss of function you're going to have. Compartment syndrome, which we'll talk about and actually part of the lab today, uh, is the second most common site that you'll see it. So the tibia being one, forearm being two. So you need good radiographs, AP and lateral, both the wrist and the elbow. Look at the wrist, wrist joints. Uh, look at the distal and radial proximal ulnar joints. Radial head should point to the capitellum. For a non-operative treatment of these fractures, uh, isolated ulnar fracture probably is something you can consider non-operatively, especially in the distal two-thirds. As that fracture migrates more proximally, I would probably tell you to consider doing something about it because further angulation of that bone is probably going to interfere with rotation as well. Pediatric fractures, obviously, we're not really talking about those. But in an adult, there's very few incidents where you'd probably leave a forearm fracture, at least a both bone forearm fracture, non-surgically managed. It's a surgical problem. And these are the outlines for the ulnar shaft. The nightstick that we call it is usually somewhere in the mid-shaft or distal two-thirds, the protective injury from getting hit over the head. You can accept some angulation there. and Sometimes they're difficult to manage with uh, bracing, but if you want to try to manage with a brace, you should probably try to stop supination and pronation because that's why they, they don't heal. And again, more proximal you get, uh, you got to try to consider fixing those. The associated elbow and wrist injuries, the Montagian, the Galeazzi, obviously those are fractures that we need to address. We've talked about some of the more proximal Montagian fractures already, uh, but uh, the Montagian fractures usually goes along with you know, dislocation of the radial head. And the galaxy, obviously, obviously, just radial, just radial joints disrupted. So Montasia is usually from a fall and outstretched arm. Beto classification kind of helps us a little bit with uh, where the radial head's going, but it doesn't really help us with our treatment. And usually restoration of the ulna is probably all you have to do to get the radial head to line itself back up. You do have to assess the stability of it, though, afterwards, because sometimes you do have subtle injuries to the capsular structures and immobilization may be warranted longer than you would want to. So uh, repairing uh, open structures of that uh, of radial uh, ligament uh, and your ligaments usually not needed, but you need to assess it. The galaxy is a fracture of necessity. We've all seen those and treat those. This radial joint obviously is disrupted here severely. You restore the radius out to length. 
Uh, but you also have to assess its uh, stability, and oftentimes the DREJ is going to be unstable. And there's several ways to address that. You have to assess whether it's stable in supination. If it is, maybe you consider just keeping them supinated for about four to six weeks. If it's still unstable in supination, maybe you turn your arm to a neutral and pin it in place or even put a screw across it uh, and hold that in there for about four to six weeks. Otherwise, you can just splint them and let them move if they are stable. The volar approach to the form is Henry approach. It goes from the FCR up to the bicipital tuberosity. Um, this is the workhorse. Most of us use this. It's pretty common. You know, the danger points are the superficial radial nerve and the radial artery, and we'll go over those in the lab today. The dorsal approach to radius is actually a reasonable approach to consider. Um, I'd say it's pretty hard to get into the proximal third. You run into the pin nerve, so you have to be careful when you're approaching it here. It's not as extensile as, as Henry, but you can see down in this corner picture here, you can still get exposure of the whole radius, but you have to deal with the thumb outcroppers. So the thumb outcroppers cross over the probably the, the junction between the middle and the distal third. And so you have to decide how you're going to take your plate through that area. People have looked at both the Henry and the Thompson approach. And uh, this recent study just a couple of years ago showed that the complication rates are similar, a little bit higher in the in the dorsal approach, but not significantly so. And they did show that you could, if you went in dorsal, you could get proximal in the radius about 16 more millimeters of exposure compared to you can with the volar. So if you have a really proximal radius fracture, you might want to consider it. And obviously the only is a subcutaneous border incision. This is a uh, pretty straightforward. The only problem with this is when you fix this, the elbow has to be flexed. So it's a, when you have an unstable situation and you're flexing the elbow, it's, it's a little bit hard to hold it. So a lot of people would tell you to try to stabilize the radius first so that when you go to fix the ulna, it's a little bit more stable. So my strategy, surgical uh, fixation strategy, is usually to fix the simplest fracture first. Not always, but most of the time. If they're both simple. I usually go after the radius first because it's laid out and flexed on the, on the, extended on the, on the forearm table. Uh, and then I'll fix the ulna when it's flexed. I use these same clamps that Jerry likes to use, <laughs> these point of reduction clamps. I put them all over the place. Sometimes I'll use a, a, a tool to try to help uh, shoehorn the, the, the bone over, like a small home and baby home or something like that. And I'll pop it in. Two, two clamps can be used to pull it apart as well. But once you get the, the simplest fracture reduced, you obviously want to try to hold that. I don't know that you have to use too many of those smaller plates to hold it provisionally. Usually they're fairly stable, but sometimes you need it an extra small plate, a little helper plate. This is an example of that. So the radius is reduced. The ulna is not reduced. And I've got these plates, you know, holding the, holding the clamps, holding the plates on, but the plate, the, the radius is a simple transverse fractured. So we're going to try to put this under some compression. So we'll go after that. Simple patterns. You want to obviously put them under compression. And when you have butterfly fragments, you want to try to lag those in. So you look for the alignment, radiographic, interoperatively. You want to make sure the plates and screws are the right length. You don't want things too long, especially when you're out distally. This radial joint can get in the way. Sometimes you'll put a screw proximally in the proximal radial joint. So just be careful. Look at all those joints. Cl check your clinical rotation interoperatively to make sure that you don't have any clicking and that you have full range of motion. So you're not mal reduce something. When, and when the two bones are comminuted, sometimes you might have a little bit of rotational malalignment. And fixation, they usually have high rates of healing. I usually I haven't done any too many nails in ulna. I've put a couple of nails in. The pediatric fractures, obviously, we put a lot of, you know, flexible nails up. But in adults, I've, I haven't put too many in. There was a little bit of time where we were using some uh, ulnar nails, but I think most of us gotten away from that now. I think you still have to restore the bow of the radius if you can. And sometimes they have these pre contoured plates to help you in the middle portion of the radius. Again, tackle the simple fracture first. I would tell you to stay away from the reconstruction plates and the thin malleable third tubulars are not strong enough. You need an LCP plate of some type, some thickness. Usually uh, for me, it's three, five, sometimes a two, seven for smaller structured folks. I use a lot of two, oh, and two, four lag screws to try to pull things together and hold some separate little fragments. I would probably say at least four to six cortices on each side and sometimes more. Uh, third tubers and recons are probably not the right answer though. So this is a, obviously one of the new metadaphseal plates that come all the way down. You can take it out from the distal aspect all the way up proximally to try to restore that alignment. Here's a case example, pretty common. 
Uh, anatomic reduction is probably the way, way to go for most of these. There are some areas where you can bridge, and if you're going to bridge, I would probably tell you the ulna is the easiest way to bridge, although sometimes you have to bridge the radius as well. So that's what you look for there. You wind up looking for a bridge on the ulna there a little bit, but distally, you've got areas of compression and lag screw fixation for absolute stability as well. Postoperatively, I think... Uh, if you do these acutely, these, these forms can be very tight when you try to close them. And I would tell you that uh, I've had several situations where we've gone in for an open fracture that was pretty badly damaged and you could not close it. So I don't hesitate to just leave a back on it if I need to. And I'll also tell you that I've closed just skin sometimes and left the fascia open. So be prepared to do that in the acute setting. If you wait a few days, some of the swelling will go out and you might be able to get them both closed. But a lot of times you'll have some problem getting both of them closed without increasing the pressures in your compartments. I would say soft dressing and definitely splint. The uh, hand and wrist do not want to move after this. I mean, this is one of these things you really have to protect the wrist and the hand, the fingers. They're not going to move much. I would probably give them at least 10 days, two weeks to let the swelling recover. And then I would take the splints off and start motion at that point. And again, you still have to address your stability of the distal radial joint and the proximal radial joint. So take home messages. In an adult, this is a surgical problem. I think you have to go for an anatomic reduction to obviously try to restore as much function as possible. There are occasions where you can consider non-operative management like a nightstick, but uh, special attention needs to be applied to the galeazzi and the montasia fractures. Compartment syndrome is something you can't miss. You have to realize that it is the second most common area that you get a compartment syndrome. And uh, open fractures increase your risk for all these things, infection, compartment syndrome, and uh, delayed union and loss of function. So... Thank you. Hopefully we got through that. Uh, so we'll talk about distal radius fractures. Uh, so learn, learning objectives, we're going to talk about some fracture pattern, uh, preoperative assessment. And if you decide to fix one of this, what are your surgical options? How do you set up the room or reduction technique and pitfalls to avoid? Uh, so dysteregious fracture, they are pretty common injury. Uh, they uh, tend to uh, happen uh, more frequently in the uh, er uh, elderly population. Uh, and uh, we all see this and we all deal with this. Uh, so it's a wide spectrum, a spectrum of injury, though you can have pretty low energy uh, injury fall from standing, or you can have very high energy injury uh, such as a picture on the bottom here from a uh, model uh, cycle collision. So looking at evaluation of this injury, uh, I think that it's uh, imperative that we understand what normal looks like. Uh, so on the picture uh, to your left, uh, that's a PA view looking at uh, a normal radiographic relationship uh, of the distal radius. Uh, and these are typically the four views I like to look at when I'm evaluating a, a distal radius. Uh, so what is abnormal? In order to know that, you, you need to know what is normal. Uh, so normal, when you're looking at this, the radius have a, a, an inclination angle. Uh, and you can also, you, uh, one other thing that you look for is the volar or uh, tilt angle. And that's uh, represented uh, there in the slides. Uh, so radio inclination is usually about greater than 10 uh, degrees uh, and radio shortening, uh, usually it's less than uh, five millimeters uh, and you can look at the volar tilt uh, here and articular step off that we really are concerned about is usually if it's greater than two millimeters. Uh, so this is a paper uh, that uh, sort of we quote a lot when we talk about uh, looking at distal radius fractures uh, and it kind of goes through what a normal radiograph looks like and, uh, and, and also help us with pattern recognition when we look at and evaluate a distal radius fracture. Uh, so over here, uh, this is a lateral radiograph here. Uh, on top is a, la is a standard lateral projection and on the bottom uh, it's when you have a, a 10 degree uh, lateral projection and you can kind of really see uh, the volo lip of the uh, distal radius, and that becomes very important when you look at certain fracture pattern uh, because the teardrop there is critical to the stability of the wrist. Uh, and uh, looking here on the uh, radiograph that you can see, 
the, on the left side, uh, you can see the relationship with the dorsal rim of the radius on a PA view. It's actually more distal uh, than the volar lip. And this is due to uh, the uh, natural inclination of the, uh, the tilt of the radius. However, when you have a distal radius fracture with dorsal angulation of the radius, that relationship becomes uh, reversed. Uh, where you look at uh, the more distal rim that you can see is actually the volar rim, and the more proximal uh, becomes the dorsal rim. And I think that relationship is uh, pretty important to appreciate when you're evaluating that. Another way to look at that is when you look at this uh, uh, radiograph here, uh, when you have that dorsal tilt, uh, the dorsal wall uh, blows out and then you have uh, uh, dorsal angulation and you can see uh, the volar rim that normally is more proximal becomes uh, very distal. Uh, and the ulnar corner uh, of the distal radius is very critical for stability of the uh, rest also and not something that we need to pay attention and we need to uh, be aware where those fragments uh, or at all times in order to uh, appropriately restore them. Uh, you can get a CT scan. A CT scan can be helpful. Uh, looking at intraticular fractures where you have impaction, uh, you can look at the relationship of the DREJ. Uh, however, a traction view, I know uh, a lot of the talks that we've given uh, regarding intraticular fractures, uh, all the speakers have talked about the importance of a traction view. Uh, so this is a, a, a patient of mine. Uh, the radiograph, the injury film is on top, on the bottom. Um, th those are intraoperative traction view, and that's very informative for me because even though uh, you have uh, the dorsal rim uh, fractured on this view, uh, the dorsal rim with ligamentous taxis is moving with the volar rim, and sometimes that can be indicative of you being able to get this off fixed for one approach versus doing two surgical approaches. When I get a traction view and I see a V sign where the dorsal rim and the volar rim are moving very separately, usually those patients tend to need a dual approach. Uh, so this is some classification. I'm going to skip over this. Uh, and then how do we predict uh, instability? Uh, one of the frustrating things about dysteregious fracture is you get patients reduced in the emergency room. You put them in the splint. They look really good. But when they show up to your clinic a week later on, they have sort of settled back to where you reduced them initially. Uh, so this is a paper, a uh, classic paper that talked about people that have greater than 20 degrees of dorsal tilt, uh, dorsal comminution, articular involvement, uh, fracture of the ulna. Uh, initial shortening greater than uh, five millimeters and patients are older uh, than 60 years old, uh, they tend to not do well and maintain their reduction. And this is all due to the initial uh, energy that goes through the fracture and also poor bone quality. Um, so uh, indication. Uh, good outcome is dependent on uh, if you have good indication or not. There are patients that are going to heal with a mild aligned distal radius. If they are low demand, they'll be happy. Uh, so you need, your job as a physician is able to identify those patients and also appropriately counsel those patients and set appropriate expectations. Uh, I think that ultimately helps uh, with that. Uh, so this is... Um, the AOS have a uh, guideline in terms of that suggest uh, patients that should uh, are candidate for operative uh, intervention and it's radio shortening greater than three millimeter uh, volar tilt that cannot be corrected greater than 10 uh, uh, degrees and then intraticular uh, uh, displacement or step off. Uh, so your treatment goal is to restore stability. You want to establish the volar cortex uh, that can withstand compressive forces through the wrist and you want overall, you want your wrist to be stable and your DREJ, you need to pay attention to that. Uh, so when you have, uh, when the forces around the uh, wrist changes in terms of where they are, I guess the alignment across the wrist, when it changes, uh, the forces that go through the wrist, especially the owner corner of the wrist significantly changes. The goal for this slide is to say, if you don't get, good restoration of the overall anatomy of the wrist. This can change the uh, forces that goes through the joint and that can translate to a painful wrist. 
Uh, so we're going to be going through this in the lab. Uh, so for volo approach, uh, these are typically uh, reserved for volo shear fractures where you buttress in them. Uh, or you can have uh, a dorsal unstable fracture where you're using lock plating to maintain uh, your reduction. And then if you have simple intraticular fractures. Uh, and the volo plate, they are commonly used, uh, but there are pitfalls associated with them. So you just need to be cognizant of them, of the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the approach. I'm going to skip through this because we're going to be going through this in the lab. Uh, and then uh, you can use uh, the plate as a reduction too. Uh, so this is, uh, I have a case example here that shows that using the plate as a reduction too, where you have the plate anchoring the distal segment. And also on the picture, on the x-ray on the right, you can see that the radial inclination and the height has not been restored yet. But then you can then subsequently rotate the plate appropriately. And when you get it done on the shaft, that can ultimately lead to uh, a wall reduce uh, rest. Uh, but this takes a lot of planning and you have to know what you, your goals are. Uh, so for setup here, uh, I'm sure this is something that is pretty common that we do. Typically, people do it on the hand table. Uh, and you just want to have... Uh, you know, either an assistant that can provide a traction or you can set up uh, a traction with uh, finger traction. Uh, so this is uh, going through some fracture reduction steps here. Uh, articular reduction is important. You can work through the metaphyseal fracture to get uh, uh, tamp up articular depression. Uh, K wires are always very uh, helpful. Uh, in order to uh, get your reduction and to maintain some of the reduction. So this is a patient that has this severely comminuted fracture. The question is, how are you going to get this reduced? Uh, you can see here there's articular uh, depression uh, here, and you can see this articular uh, surface here is completely flipped and is looking 90 degrees uh, dorsally. Uh, so, again, how do you decide? You can get a traction view intraoperatively. This is a, the a patient I presented earlier. This patient ultimately uh, needed uh, a dual approach. This is a patient 14 months out. She does have some evidence of arthrosis of the wrist, but ultimately she has a stable functioning on wrist. Uh, so, you, uh, bridge uh, external or uh, bridge uh, uh, fixator is an option. You can use K wires and arc joint. Uh, to help maintain your reduction uh, and other things that you can do. You can do uh, a bridge plate uh, for this. Uh, the downside for a bridge plate of the distal radius, you have to go back and get the plate out. Uh, so this is a, a patient here with, uh, this is a setup uh, where you basically get uh, basically closed reduction and you can slide the plate across and anchor it to the second metal torso and then to the radial shaft. Uh, so this is, uh, you want to make sure you don't over distract the joint though when you do this technique. So some pitfalls to avoid, you want to avoid intraticular screw penetration. You want to get good uh, radiograph. And on that view, the styloid screw there looks intraticular. However, when you get uh, a better lateral down the joint, you can clearly see that the screw is out of the joint. Uh, and then avoid dorsal screw penetration because that can lead to uh, ex uh, extensor tendon irritation or ruptures. Uh, and also one of the things that you can see if you look critical on some uh, radiograph is you can get translation of the distal articular block and that ultimately affects uh, the reduction of your DRUJ. Uh, and you can get dorsal rim, rim instability that you don't recognize. And if you don't address those, those patients will end up, the whole carpus will fall uh, dorsally and dislocate. Uh, and then the volo lip, this is the honor corner. Uh, some of the plates on the market doesn't specifically address this corner. And if you don't get this buttress appropriately, you can get escape of the carpus. Uh, so fragment-specific fixation is something that you can do uh, to address uh, this problem. Uh, DRUJ, uh, when you're done, you want to pay attention. If you have honor fracture or honor styloid fracture, sometimes uh, can be uh, 
an indication that you might have DRG instability. All right, so take home message. Uh, you want to identify the fracture pattern uh, and you want to determine uh, stability based on the fracture pattern uh, and appropriate approach and implant. Uh, you want to address all of your columns and you want to respect the soft tissue envelope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful uh, explanation about uh, right from clavicle to the distal radius. And I welcome uh, Dr. Frank Laipurache and uh, our friend who joined us a little late, Dr. Daniel Horvitz. How are you doing, sir? Good morning to you. Good morning, and thank you for having us. It's, uh, it's an honor to participate with our colleagues from around the world. And, and um, it, it was a pleasure with the AOS a number of times I've been able to interact with um, with India and your colleagues, and it really has been a pleasure every time. So we both were looking forward to today quite a bit. Uh, we'll have wonderful uh, sessions now. And uh, should I start with the question number one, asked by one Dr. M. H. Ahmad. Solution for scapula fractures, which have not been included as a part of it. In nutshell, if you can just give a broader outline about scapula fracture. Well, um, that, that is something that's in some ways established and in some ways evolving. Anytime there's obviously shoulder joint instability uh, with the glenoid component really would mandate addressing that uh, operatively. Um, you know, uh, but when it comes uh, to actual scapula body fractures or fractures with the neck or fractures in combination with the clavicle, a lot of those indications are uh, evolving. There are some centers uh, in the United States that are getting more aggressive with that, uh, especially in the Midwest. Um, but without significant shoulder instability, uh, significant angulation of the glenoid or excessive medialization, these still, uh, the most common standard of care would be to treat non-operatively. Yeah, I would I would agree. The uh, the exception being a, a floating shoulder where you would fix the clavicle, and in our in our practice, I would say unless there is direct extension intraarticular, it's almost never that we would fix a scapular body fracture. And Thank you very much for that. Yeah, and there's another question uh, for proximal humerus greater tuberosity fracture. Do you use hook plates, and can you please? Uh, Share some details about it. This is asked by one Dr. Marush Kavara. I, Dan, I, assume I think they you mean, want to answer that one. You yeah, like I that assume question. They mean, they mean the hook plates like Dr. Jones showed. Um, so for me, the majority of greater tuberosity fractures, um, I don't rely on the bone. As, as Dr. Jones pointed out in his lecture, these are often very comminuted or they have poor bone. I'm not a fan of the hook plate that he showed. I think they're very prominent, and by definition, they're sitting outside the soft tissue because that's the purpose of the hook, is to capture the soft tissue. So um, I've seen several that had significant impingement. My preferred method with greater tuberosity fractures, with the exception of a very young patient with a large piece with very good bone, my standard is to use suture fixation. So I'm usually, usually using flexible suture fixation with screws as posts for the sutures. Yeah, I think I agree with pretty much everything Dan said. I do often like to use uh, small T plates. They don't, they, whether they're 3.5 or even often smaller, but certainly nothing that's going to go superior to the greater tuberosity gets me very worried. Okay, got it. And uh, there's one more question uh, from Dr. Partha Pal. He's asking, what's your suggestion about uh, ulnar nerve transposition? So, so that's, we're doing uh, distal humerus here. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, there's been the pendulum has swung in many directions over the years. There's some good evidence to prove that. Uh, ulnar nerve transposition without the direct impingement by the hardware that's being used offers no beneficial result um, and carries with it uh, the risk of atrogenic damage, but also atrogenic stripping of the microvascular blood supply to the ulnar nerve. 
So I think many of us in, in the OTA um, will transpose the ulnar nerve only if there's hardware impingement. Otherwise, we may uh, mobilize it in a limited way not to be dangerous during our surgery, but really respect the microvascular blood supply and its enveloping soft tissue. Thank you, Chair. Any, any different idea, uh, Dr. Daniel? Uh, no. We, the only, in our practice, the only indication for transposition is if the uh, medial hardware has extended, as Frank talked about, into the ulnar groove and the nerve is essentially sitting on uh, the plate. Short of that, we would not transpose. So in other words, make sure that uh, the implants do not come out on the medial side where there is a lot now going on over there. So keep it short of length over there. Well, you, you, you have to put the, Im yes, if possible, but you have to if put possible. the implants for the stability. And if sometimes you need to go distal, then, then you can always transpose if need be. But um, stability is key. You don't want to sacrifice stability to the elbow. Uh, I want to ask you that generally, even there is some dorsal displacement like uh, colitis fracture also, we put a uh, volar plate in the distal radius. So what are the indications for putting a dorsal plate? Well, most uh, the, one of the biggest indications um, is often for a separate coronal split on the ulna side of the radius with a displaced dorsal ulna piece of the distal radius. Um, when those are ignored or do not get appropriate fixation from the front or have poor quality <laughs> bone, you start seeing a fading of the distal radial ulnar joint stability in the subacute period, and that's very dangerous. So that's something to really look out for. But there are some fractures, some dive punch fractures, which exit dorsally, um, and other fractures which are primarily dorsal that with some of the lower profile hardware, um, that makes the most mechanical sense. But the majority of distal radius fractures do not fall into that and the bowler plating for the majority is okay, but you have to be wary. I think, I think the dynamic floral view after you volar plated, if you know that there are dorsal rim fragments, a dynamic C-arm view is crucial because if you see any dorsal subluxation, then that tells you that you've underestimated potentially dorsal instability. And that's a situation where I would go in and place lo very low profile uh, dorsal plates. In distal radius, we give a lot of emphasis to fixation of uh, radius, but what about uh, the ulnar styloid and uh, whatever is the complex on the ulnar side, the FCC? How many times will you address to that or you will wait till the patient develops some kind of symptoms and you attend to that? So I will say we will always evaluate the DRUJ stability after getting radial uh, bone stability, but we infrequently fix uh, ulnar styloid fragments. And even with a base of the ulnar styloid fragment, it's been shown there's only 11% of the time that has concomitant DRUJ instability. But there is also the aspect of the ulna neck just under the ulna head, and that's very different. And if you look at the three column theory of the distal radius, if you have comminution of the ulna neck right up to where the head is, or including the head, as well as a significant distal radius fracture, now you have an unstable distal forearm. So that, I th think the threshold's a bit lower um, on stabilizing that as well. A little bit of a different reason. Uh, it's almost analogous to like a transolecranon fracture dislocation in the elbow, sort of. Dan, what do you think about that? I would totally agree. I think I was very happy many years ago, there was a very good prospective randomized study that looked at fixation of the ulnar styloid, and I was ecstatic when they said we didn't need to fix them. Um, but if you underestimate, if you call something an ulnar styloid when it's really an ulnar neck fracture, that can be a disaster. And so those are ones that uh, we tend to treat those we, we, almost as a both bone variant. And we will usually use uh, some mini frag plates to try to stabilize the distal ulna and maintain the anatomy. Um, that's sufficient from my side because I will be coming back with rapid fire questions, which you have agreed to answer. We'll come to that. May I request Dr. Jangit from Gurgaon to ask his question, sir? 
Yeah. Thank you, sir. And uh, excellent presentation as always. And we learned a lot about the tips and tricks. So the first question is that regarding the clavicular fractures. So how frequently do you need to remove the plates? And are the anterior plates much more prominent uh, hardware as compared to the superior plates? So Frank? Um, uh, we we right. with uh, Dan go ahead. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, Dan go with ahead. Doc, with <laughs> Dr. Sanders. I'm sorry, were you uh, who are you addressing the question to? I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Any any both of you can answer. No problem. So uh, with Dr. Sanders in Tampa, we published a series several years ago looking at superior plates versus anterior inferior plates. The hypothesis was that superior plates would need to be removed significantly more frequently, and that was the case. It was anywhere from 40 to 45 percent of the time, as opposed to about five to seven percent with anterior inferior plates. Um, so that, combined with the ad additional biomechanical stability from an anterior plate, for me. I don't put superior plates on. I pretty much only use anterior and inferior plates with the exception of sometimes using, if, if I'm dual plating with very small plates, which Dr. Liprachi has, uh, has greater experience than I do, sometimes we'll put a 2-0 plate superiorly. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Dr. Horowitz said. And we uh, our group also published a number of years ago on with the anterior and inferior plate, even using a 2.7 recon plate and having uh, equivocal results to even thicker anterior plates. So, you know, it really is very technique dependent when um, uh, about getting appropriate stability and a compromise with soft tissue irritation. But uh, I'm with Dan. I, I favor anterior plating. Obviously, there's a lot of literature out there which shows superior plating is very effective, but I think to answer your question, we do we can do a better job with symptoms anteriorly, at least many of us. Great. <clears throat> so the next question is, uh, most of the patients we treat non-operatively, and there are a lot of uh, things we use, tend to use, either just an arm pouch or a figure of faith. So what's your protocol to treat them non-operatively, both of them, uh, Frank and Dan? Non-operatively, just a standard sling. Um, you know, there's been some evidence at least on um in in america about figure of eight can actually cause soft tissue irritations and can also be an issue with patient compliance um so the um standard is just a sling usually starting pretty early with pendulums uh exercises just to keep a supple glenohumeral joint um, and, and really it's a very limited time, three to four weeks with the sling. And then I, I personally wait six to eight weeks before allowing lifting. And if they're very active, like in the gym or, or lifting very heavy things or doing push ups, I'll tell them to do that at eight to 12 weeks, depending. Yeah, we use a sling, uh, for comfort. I'll actually let them come out immediately to type, right. And we just limit lifting to three to five pounds for the first couple of weeks. Other than that, I think the literature would say you're not really going to prevent shortening. You're not going to prevent displacement. It will be what it will be. Um, and so it's just to make sure they don't. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so there's a question regarding the, uh, if there's radial nerve palsy along with the humerus fracture, whether a simple fracture or a commercial fracture, how are you going to proceed? Are you going to operate or? the non-operatively i mean it's, it's just it's just part of the constellation that can happen with the injury as long as it's not a penetrating injury um and even like a gunshot penetrating injury could be a blast injury that's going to recover but if it's like a a, a a knife a sharp object penetrating injury right in the area that's a little different that i would you know go in with a colleague that does nerve repair but otherwise i i do not get influenced by the presence of a radial nerve palsy on whether it's an operative or non-operative indication. Um, and then following that out, if clinically there is any response of return of the radial, radial nerve by five or six weeks, it can be subtle, but anything, they don't even need an EMG at that point. If there is absolutely nothing, then I wait five or six weeks, get an EMG, 
whether it be for a baseline or optimism or anything, but really that first EMG is a baseline. And then you follow them again till 12 weeks and then see what the story is, if they need a repeat EMG or not, et cetera. And during this, I would agree. To give them some kind of steroid or no, no steroid? Well, no, no, really no, no, no. no. If, if for spinal cord injury, they've backed off yeah. the steroids a bit, <laughs> I think for a little humeral fracture, <laughs> that may be aggressive. Uh, <laughs> so, there's only one exception to, to what Frank just said. I, Dr. Lipracci, I agree completely. The only exception for me, and I probably see this once a year, it's usually a young person, um, early 20s, 30s, short oblique distal third fracture, mm -hmm. and they present without a radial nerve palsy. They have complete radial nerve palsy and progressively over seven to 10 days, I see a progressive radial nerve palsy. And on some of those I've gone in and indeed have found the radial nerve draped over the fracture. And because there was not enough adequate stability and maybe perhaps uh, we, they could have been in a tighter splint and, and we fix those. So for me, that's a relative indication but only an evolving palsy. They come in neurologically intact and then they start to lose function. Sometimes I've been afraid to just watch those. Maybe that's like the prostatype of fracture, right? Yeah, and Dan, those probably would be going on to a non-union anyway, right? Because yeah. they, they wouldn't be feeling, you know, usually <clears throat> if you're going to have a success and I know it's, you know, we wait four weeks, there's some literature, six weeks about losing motion, feeling good, but in reality, if it's seven to 10 days out, you're that unstable where you get a radial nerve palsy, that one wasn't going to be successful non-operatively, most likely. Right. And I'd rather yeah. find the radial nerve at 10 days rather than six or eight weeks. Agreed. And uh, what's your indication for the nailing for the humerus fracture? Or do you prefer always plating? <clears throat> I mean, always and never dangerous, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the one thing we should just take off the table is worrying about if you have a multi-trauma and you're better at plating than nailing, you can still use your arm to use your walker as you're recovering from your lower extremity. So the primary thing is really saying when shouldn't you nail um, more so than do I nail or plate this or that? Because they're fairly equivocal. With our more medialized starting points and everything else, they're fairly equivocal. It's what you do better um, and you know what the patient will tolerate. So when shouldn't you nail? If the fracture is way too high or way too low, it's more obvious when it's way too high, you're not going to get the adequate stability in the head. But the fracture may not be all that low on the bone, but it's too low to get a stable nail. So if the, and, and you have to remember, it's got to be significantly above the superior aspect of the olecranon fossa to not either have poor stability or create an iatrogenic distal third humeral fracture when seating an integrate nail. You know, there are some newer locked, very good retrograde nails, but also you can have a lot of iatrogenic issues with that. And those fractures have to be very high to put them in because of where your starting point is and how much dorsal bone you need to remove to apply them. So really, I think it's more important to look at when you shouldn't nail. And then at that point, it's fairly equivocal based on what you're good at. What do you think, Dan? I would agree. And I would just add on the few occasions that I do nail, which is at most once a year, I almost always do an open nailing, meaning I almost always make a small incision and I will stick my finger in to make sure that one, if it's a mid-shaft fracture, the radial nerve is not entrapped. Um, and two, I think it's very difficult sometimes to make sure you don't leave a significant gap when you're nailing. And so I think sometimes getting some of the soft tissue and hematoma out of the way is helpful. Again, I'm not talking about a 10 centimeter incision. I'm talking about a one centimeter spreading well, down. <clears throat> Just to put your finger in, right? So one interesting question is how to evaluate the proximal radio and the joint when you're fixing the both bone forearm or a Montagia fracture? Like we all know how to assess the distal radio in the joint. How do you assess the proximal radio in the joint about its stability during the surgery? Proximal radial in the joint. I mean, it, it's important. You know, 
you, we can go back to some of the basics, you know, that in pretty much every single view, the uh, capitellum and radial head are perfectly aligned. Like that's your biggest key. And then if you have fairly proximal plating on the radius or fairly proximal plating on the ulna, I think one view that we may not get frequently enough, and we have that opportunity with fluoroscopy to get any view we want very accurately, is a view of the PRUJ, um, uh, the proximal radial ulna joint, right down it, because almost like a mortise in an ankle, there should be symmetry throughout this, this area of the body, right? So it should be a very symmetric PRUJ, there should be no hardware in it, obviously. And, you know, at the same time, you also can look at your own trochlear joint from that view. And if there's asymmetry there, there's some sort of problem with the complex. And so I think using those two mentalities, you know, nothing's a guarantee, but can, can, can help make you more comfortable leaving the operating room. I would also add um, dynamic fluoro can be extremely helpful for subtle instability. Absolutely. And we, we should not forget that most of us have two extremities. So just like for the, for the mortise, looking at the contralateral side to get a map of what normal should look like, there have been occasions where I thought this looks great. And you look at the other side and you realize it might look great, but it looks very different from the other side. And you, you cannot discount that. So that's a great that's clue. Right. And then... <clears throat> That's an advantage for operating on a limb that you have the other side. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think Dr. Dalip has told me this is my last, last question. We can move forward. Thank you. Is that mute? Doctor, I think you're on mute. I'm muted. Yeah, just muted. Yeah, Professor Ravi, please. Yeah. Thank you, Anand. This is a very nice uh, session. Very, very interesting and very brisk. And uh, we are almost on time. I thank all the speakers for that, for uh, good deliverance of lecture and also meeting time. Uh, coming to questions, uh, Dr. Suryanarayan wants to know, uh, he gets uh, a complication or uh, difficult stuff during surgery, like uh, the head of the humerus slipping into varus position. Uh, what are the tips to avoid slipping into varus and maintaining valgus position of the head of the humerus? So with, for with operative treatment, with plating, is that what we're referring yes. to? Yes. Okay. So I think the one thing is many of the commercially available proximal humeral plates you have a oblong hole is the most proximal hole for the shaft part of the plate. And I think that gives us a sense of security about let's start there so we can adjust where the plate goes. But the one thing also is we have a very advanced blade plate, basically, in the humeral plate. So my preference is to get the plate perfectly positioned to the proximal fragment once I either reduce the tuberosities to it or if it's a big two part. And if you have the plate reduced to the proximal fragment, abutting it correctly, the shaft of the plate may be sticking off the shaft of the bone, which actually is going to help you dial everything into valgus. And then once you dial into valgus, if you actually use the inferior aspect of that oval screw, which gives you opportunity for adjustment, that's going to cause a lateral compression and further promote valgus and further promote impacting the, the shaft into the head for further stability. So that that's, um, I think those things have been very helpful uh, to maintain proper valgus and to also maintain that long-term. So I'm not as, I'm, I must not be, I know I'm not as good a surgeon as Dr. Liparachi. Uh Placing the plate and, and placing proximal fixation uh, often frightens me because that is the limited real estate, which is the humeral head. So I prefer to do two things. Number one is I generally like to have provisional reduction with multiple K-wires from both anterior and superior um, and have my alignment very close before I even put my plate in. 
in general, I will also fix the plate to the shaft in the oblong screw. And the biggest advantage that I use is multiple sutures in the rotator cuff, attaching to the lesser and the greater, to pull the head into valgus. And I will almost always have an assistant manually holding it out of varus while I place my first screw into the head. The key is you cannot place six screws into the humeral head and then realize you're in varus. That's, oh, no. yeah. you, you've, you're game over. You can't salvage that. So for me, the key is placing one locked screw and then very carefully assessing. Am I in varus? Am I in valgus? What's my overall reduction? Because if you're happy, then you can place multiple screws. Um, so I prefer sutures. I prefer getting a provisional fixation. Uh, Frank probably has a more sensitive eye to where to plate the place. Plates the plate, and it's a great technique as long as you don't make a boo-boo. Yeah, and you have to check that proximal plate placement with only one or two screws and one or two wires because you don't want to waste the real estate because at times you have to readjust. But if, if you're able to assess it's placed correctly and nicely, just like with the blade plate, now all you have to do to reduce the surgical neck is reduce the distal part of the plate to the distal part of the shaft in correct alignment. So it's, you know, it's an indirect reduction technique. And Dan brings up a great point with the sutures. No matter how you do it, you need to have an uh, ample amount of sutures and they have to engage the plate as a further support and tension band. Yeah. Well, the next question is from Dr. Prabodh Kumar, who wants to know your opinion about percutaneous fixation of the distal radius non artillery fractures when DRUJ is intact. DRUJ is intact, non artillery fractures, percutaneous fixation. Your opinion about that, sir? So there is, there is good literature in younger patients especially. You can do percutaneous fixation. We know from pediatric experience, up to probably 12 or 14, the standard is probably a closed reduction in percutaneous pinning. In an adult, we will occasionally do it um, the problem is we know biomechanically that percutaneous pins are not going to be as durable or as strong unless they're combined with a percutaneous external fixation. Now, Dr. Liparachi, Dr. Liparachi had me give a talk a couple of weeks ago on the role, for ex, role of external fixation, which is percutaneous. And although I think many people have moved away from it, the results at six months for extra-articular distal radius fractures are exactly the same for external fixation with augmentation with percutaneous pins or volar lock plating. So they both work. So you don't need to make an incision, although we recognize there are advantages to plating, probably earlier recovery, pin tract infections. Absolutely. Agree a hundred percent. And, um, you know, with the X, the X fix shouldn't be a lost art. Um, number one, but the non-spanning X fix is very technically demanding and requires quite a bit of strong bone. So, you know, I think most of us, we're, if we're X fixing, are going to go from second metacarpal to more proximally in the radius than the injury. And, you know, spanning the wrist joint, as Dan said, within a few months is unnoticeable in terms of their ultimate function. Dr. Dr. Tornetta makes a really important point. When you are doing an external fixator, or even when you're just doing percutaneous spinning, the key is extension. They must be an extension. If you don't leave them an extension, then you will lose significant function. No distraction, and they have to be an extension. The next question is uh, much simpler one, like uh, which bone should be op operated first? In case of uh, both bones forearm fracture, which bone should be fixed fixed first? That's uh, your opinion about that. Simple the question, one. simple answer, the simple fracture. <laughs> yep. How to manage stiffness in conservatively managed distal shaft humerus fractures persisting even after six months from Dr. Ranjit? So you're talking about like elbow contracture, elbow stiffness. Is that that's stiffness. what we're referring to? Yeah. So you know, basically, 
you want a hundred percent you can you want a hundred percent healing of the bone reason being if you go through dynamic splinting and that doesn't work and go through all non-operative ways of trying to remedy the stiffness then you're going to need to do a capsule release very thoughtfully front back capsule release but a capsule release is the best thing to do to help a joint move. And it's the worst thing to do stripping everything to help a fracture heal. So if they're already stiff, honestly, who cares until they're healed? Now they're healed. And that's not a concern. And if they're significantly stiff, requiring operative capsule release front back, then they also, in my opinion, should get a ulnar nerve release. I'm not going to necessarily say a transposition, but a release, because then if you acquire acutely that flexion in the operating room, just from all of that, after the ulnar nerve being shortened and stiffened for so long, you could end up with a significant palsy that may not remedy itself. Um, I don't know, Dan, what are your thoughts? It, it's rare that we will treat, um, treat them non-operatively. If they're minimally displaced, then we would immobilize, especially in an elderly person, uh, we would typically just immobilize them for six weeks and then begin early motion. The distal humerus fractures that we've treated conservatively, um, if they heal, our experience has been they actually don't get stiff. They usually have more motion than ones that we've gone in on and surgically treated. Um, but other than that, I would completely agree with Frank. If, if they do get stiff, you have to be 100% healed and then you can do in a very aggressive soft tissue release. Uh, next question is from Dr. Vishnu. Uh, is asking the criterion regarding fixing ulnar styloid in the. Uh, criterion regarding fixing ulnar styloid in the. Uh, oh, in the distal radius. Um, I mean, pretty much. Similar to what we said before, DRUJ instability, fix it, very rare. Uh, and distal ulna neck, high comminution, lower threshold to fix it. Agreed. Over multiple fractures in children below five years managed. Multiple fractures in children below five years, how are they managed? There's a question from Dr. Ashia Sultan. You mean like a floating elbow, forearm, humerus? Possibly so. Even I don't understand. Maybe she's asking so, so. about battered baby kind of situation. That may, that's also a possibility. No, no, no. I, I, I think if, uh, I mean, 99% of our forearm fractures in the pediatric population will be treated closed. I think that uh, with a, a trauma or a child abuse, um, there that would be one of the indications where they might, we might consider flexible pin fixation of a uh, fracture so, so that you don't have to immobilize the elbow. But I, I'm not sure I've seen that. It's, I mean, that would be unbelievably rare. Great. That's all. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you very question. much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ravi. And now we go to Kolkata, which is the east part. May I request Dr. A.K. Pal to start with his questions? You need to unmute yourself, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Congratulations for a very excellent session. So, so first question is by Dr. Vijay Bhattacharya. So how can you please elaborate the, the technique of taking the traction flame, traction flame for fracture? Intraarticular fracture elbow, specific technique, and once time when we take the traction flim. So we obtain our traction views in the emergency room acutely, and uh, it, it involves elbow extension, a manual pull on the forearm, and shooting a single uh, AP view, and then they get splinted. Uh, do, do you use any any anesthesi anesthesia or analgesia? Usually not. Uh, occasionally, someone will get some mild sedation, but in general, it's like getting a traction view of the hip. We like to say we use it's okay anesthesia. We say it's okay, it's okay, 
shoot the picture uh, because to give somebody conscious sedation in the radiology suite is a little difficult. That means having many people in there, they're monitoring them. So that's never really worked for us. Frank, you agree? Disagree? Oh, 100%. Dr. I think the, I think Dr. Paul may be having an internet connection. Internet issue. connection oh, yes. problem. Yes. Yes. Hello, hello. No, Dr. Paul is back. Dr. Paul is back. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, do you think this same same technique do you use for technique? Do you use for the radial head fracture with medial collateral ligament for stress? Uh, I, I apologize, Dr. Paul, but um, I think your internet's cutting in and out, and I, Dr. Horowitz and I can't fully hear all the points of the question. We do take the same traction flame for the stress views for, to evaluate the medial collateral ligament injury along with radial head fracture. Medial collateral ligament injury of the elbow along with ligament and the radial head fracture, you use the same stress views. Same radiographic traction views. Uh, no, I mean in in, in in general, obviously, if the radial head is fractured or the radial neck is fractured, you can't really get a good medial stress view until you provide some lateral stability. So, it, in my experience, that's almost always an intraoperative, pure valgus stress view once you've restored lateral column stability. Okay. Yeah, because you're going to make your operative indication off a static film at a radial head in the elbow joint, and then you may not go to the operating room at all, and then they heal. Thank you. There is another question by Dr. Vijay Bhattacharya. What is the treatment management protocol for comminuted intraarticular fracture distal humerus with articular bone loss? So that's always a challenge for everyone. Um, the number one thing not to do. So let's let's first assume it's not a patient we're considering a total elbow, and let's assume it's not a patient where we're saying a bag of bones. So somebody we're going to fix. Um, never change the radius of curvature of that complex joint. Never, even if it involves gaps, some gaps, because then you have a problem. Like allowing a gap and then compressing through that gap and you change all the mechanics, you've given them essentially a painful, poor elbow fusion, <laughs> ultimately. Um, now, if it's a very, very, very significant gap, there have been um, two times I could think of in my career, which I actually uh, was exposed to this technique by one of my partners, John Capo, where I've taken some radial head and flipped it around and used it as an osteochondral graft to make up for a deficit because it's as close as you have in that acute setting to help with your trochlea. Um, and it's, I mean, two times in almost 20 years though, and very rare. So I think and there are two times, times, yeah, I think there are two times when you have articular loss where it's really lost. One is an older osteoporotic patient where there's just a segment that is just destroyed. Total elbow. Um, well, I don't mean I don't mean the joint is destroyed, but there's a segment in the middle. And in my experience, it usually ends up being a three, four millimeter section. So you still have uh, you still have radial head articulation. You still have proximal ulnar articulation. But the point that Dr. Liberace made is if if there's a space, it's very easy to, to close things down. In that situation, I have taken a piece of allograft and placed it in, leaving the articular surface empty, leaving a, a several millimeter gap so there's no impingement, but just putting a spacer in there. What's more common in my practice is a younger patient, high energy, open injury, where there is actually is a segment of bone that is somewhere on the highway. And in my practice, what we would do is we would do a reconstruction, leave a methyl methacrylate spacer with the plan of coming back at six or eight weeks, exposing it, removing it, and putting in some type of osteochondral graft. You could take it from autograft, from distal femur, or just fresh frozen. Um, because I would not do something acutely in an open injury that, that was devascularized. 
Yeah, absolutely. Not in an open injury. Yeah. There is another question of Dr. Hyman Chetupani. So, what is the uh, surgical approach for open surgical approach for distal humerus fracture in children? Distal humerus fracture in children, especially the supracondylar fracture. What is the surgical approach? Yeah. For us, for us, the surgical approach is in general a one centimeter direct anterior transverse incision. And you're either you can either take a, a tonsil and put it in to sweep, but you can always take your finger and get right down to the anterior cortex and judge your reduction uh, that way. So the only medial or lateral incisions we would make um, would be perhaps a small medial incision if we needed to place uh, medial wires. But our approach is almost always direct anterior. What is your opinion of three-window anterior approach by... Louis Fernando Calixto. Louis Fernando Calixto, it is AOS daily edition in 2016. There is a three window anterior approach of elbow by Louis Fernando Calixto. He delivered his, uh, this technique in AOS daily edition in 2016. I don't three think I'm familiar with the, uh, an approach by that, that particular name. Uh, it may be similar to something Dan or I does. How does it deviate from a standard anterior approach to the elbow? Uh, maybe we're just unfamiliar with the title of it. Okay. <laughs> this is the last question. What is the, uh, uh, what is the role of coracoclavicular suture or screw fixation along with plate fixation in clavicle? So that's a good question. And that's always a challenge in many ways to fix these issues, right? <laughs> Um, so, um, with a distal clavicle fracture, whether you do a hook plate, whether you do a, a Bosworth screw, uh, you have to get some stability over there. And I think many of us are moving to, I, like, I will personally try to do two 90, 90, 2.4, 2.0 millimeter plates, uh, for the distal clavicle and put a suture anchor in the coracoid that has three limbs. So I'll take one limit at suture and tie down the medial aspect, the stable part of the distal clavicle to get that height right. And then put one of then put a superior small little T plate on top to try to fix as much as possible. Put the second limit suture around that and then put a small anterior one and put the third around that. Once in a while, if it's too destructive and you're relying too much on the suture fixation, I'll do a stage spanning of the AC joint with a small 2-7 plate with the intention of removing it at about 12 weeks. Um, Dan, what about you? Yeah, so my I, I have a slightly different philosophy. I'm talking very distal clavicle fractures, distal one-fifth yes. fracture. Um, yeah. To me, the, 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 to me, that is basically an, a, a grade four or five AC separation that just happened to have left some clavicle behind. So I'm a little more old school. I will put a, a loop of number five fiber wire around the coracoid. That is my primary fixation. I'll then make a drill hole in the intact clavicle, suture it down just like I would in a C separation. And then I generally augment it with a couple of sutures through the distal bone into the distal clavicle as well, just so I have good bony opposition. I don't think that actually provides a lot of stability. I think it just tends to bring what is often a comminuted fracture together. And I've had excellent luck with that. Um, I personally think that the hook plate is the worst implant ever designed. I just cannot conceive of its role. Um, I think you can achieve the same stability with fixation to the coracoid and not have to come back and take a plate out. So I, I don't use them ever. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, since we started late by almost 15 minutes, we have few minutes. So may I request Dr. Frank and Dr. Daniel, if you are agreeable, then we go with the rapid fire with permission of all my fellow moderators from India. Flexible nail or a plate in clavicle? Why? When? If it's operative, uh, I personally always plate them. I think I just do a better job and uh, we, we discuss the ways to avoid tissue prominence. So that's my personal belief. Dan? I, I agree. Dan? And the downside, 
was almost zero. Second rapid fire in osteoporotic bones, proximal humerus, three part, phyllos or multi lock nail? Plate. Plate. Good. I love to put into <laughs> multi lock nail and it gives good results, but whatever you choose. Okay. You have clarified anterior or superior plate for clavicle, but your indication when will you put anterior plate and when will you put a superior plate? Nearly always anterior. And if there is a superior plate, it's usually a supplement plate, very, very thin, 2 or 24 millimeter type plate just to help stabilize length and rotation, and you can leave it in or take it out. But the primary fixation for me is always anterior. And Daniel, how about you? Thank okay. you. You people, you people love to plate shaft of humerus. We love to nail them. Now, what is your indication for nailing a humerus? For me, the only absolute indication is a pathologic fracture. <laughs> I'll also do it on a very heavy person with uh, coagulation issues, soft tissue issues, you know, burns, excoriations, just poor soft tissue envelope. Um, so those are other times where I, I think nailing is superior, provided the fracture pattern allows proper stability. I will say I've seen many open fractures, a lot of soft tissue injury, where someone says, well, because of that, we're going to nail it. And the truth is, by the time you do an adequate debris run, you're looking at enough to plate it. So No, you're, you're right about that. But I'm talking about the type of soft tissue injury where you have like skin avulsion, things like that, where Burns. it's not an open fracture IND, you know? Or cutaneous spinning of humerus with thicker wires and threaded wires in three-part fractures. I think that that was a great thing to draw pictures in articles in the 90s, and it's full of complications and issues, and I think we have better answers. So for me, that's not part of my practice. No, no. Right. Daniel? So there are probably several times a year in select patients, it's usually patients in their 60s to 70s, where for whatever reason, um, I don't want to make an incision. And my technique is not wires. My technique is I place usually two or three wires for cannulated screws, and then I trade out the wires with fully threaded 5.0 or 6.5 screws. And you can actually get quite good stable fixation percutaneously, and then I treat them as if they're a closed fracture. I don't move them for the first two to three weeks. I treat them as if we're going conservatively. I've had good luck with that in patients where I wasn't happy with the alignment, but I did not want to open them up and put plates. Well, Dan, you're cheating. You added screws. That wasn't the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. Wires, 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 wires are, are, it's, it's parallel to that. No wires. It's no wires, no wires. <laughs> 1990 plates or parallel plates, distal humerus? Based on fracture pattern. We did biomechanical evidence study in JOT a number of years ago, which showed with modern plates, modern locking plates, the most important thing is fracture pattern. The plates all hold up. Good. I would agree. The, I will point this out. The one advantage of, nine, of, of 9090, the posterior plate very often restores your normal lateral plane contour. I've seen many medial lateral plates where they left the distal humerus in extension almost impossible to do if you have a posterior lateral plate. So for me, I train residents. I prefer that because I think they're less likely to screw it up. Comminuted fractures of head and neck of radius. There are enough complications of replacement also. So would you excise or would you replace? Excise? Yeah, excision head and neck of uh, radius. Oh, the radius. Oh, the ra I'm sorry. I thought you said humerus. <laughs> radius, I, sorry, I, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say I'm not familiar with that technique. <laughs> no, no. Bro so, so usually at, the, at, at this point in time, I think most it is very limited indication for excision of a radial head. I think I think we've all learned that you can have long term complications with that, and and the issue of radial head loosening. <laughs> 
is not necessarily a, a complication. Also, there's plenty of literature to support that. So I have a low threshold if I can't fix it to replace it, if it's more than three fragments or super poor quality bone or a lot of comminution in the radial neck in osteoporosis, because then it's a non-union machine. I agree. It's difficult to imagine how you could have that injury to the radial head without either having significant interosseous injury or some type of other instability around the elbow and to leave it unstable, to, re to resect the radial head and, and the radial shaft is somehow unstable is a disaster. Anyways, that's a common practice in India. We exercise head and neck of radius. And uh, after 20 years, maybe you have distant radius ulna problem, but that's a matter we will not discuss now. Only one question, short answer. Fibula in calcar part of humerus in porotic bones, pros and cons of that. May I repeat? Using fibula in calcar portion of humerus on the medial side where it's very porotic. Pros and cons. For proximal, for proximal humerus Proximal humerus fractures, sir. Yeah. When you are doing bleeding. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, for I would prefer to impact the humeral shaft into the head. Um, when they fail... My shoulder partners, it is, a, as it was pointed out in the lecture, it's a disaster. And one of my ex-partners, Dr. Kubiak, they looked up a series in Utah of elderly osteoporotic treated with fibula struts, without fibula struts. They had worse results with, with the fibula struts because I think there's a tendency to maintain anatomic length. And I think you leave more intrinsic instability. So I would rather just shorten them. I agree 100% with that. Because people have fancy that we must put fibula, so I wanted to bring this point that there are more disadvantages than advantages. Now, I don't want to hog the uh, limelight throughout, so any of my colleagues wants to ask any question, otherwise we'll take another three minutes for conclusion, and last, we'll take screenshot of everybody so that we can keep it as a memoralia for all of us. Yes, sir. Anybody? I have one question. I have one question. So, for uh, proximal humeral fracture uh, with uh, in elderly, so what is the role of unilateral biplanar mini external fixation for proximal humeral fracture in elderly? <laughs> it, it, I'm laughing because one of my partners who did his fellowship in Cincinnati uh, came back and was showing me pictures of using external fixation for proximal humerus fractures. And <laughs> I said, I will never do that. I cannot conceive of ever doing that. And three months later, I did it in one patient. And it was someone with a vascular injury. And they had huge sur surgical incisions for vascular repair and a very unstable proximal humerus that was putting the repair at risk. That's the only time I've done it. Um, I can't tell you that it's a bad idea. I think some people are doing it and getting decent results. I just haven't done it. They don't move very much. That's for sure. Yeah. Professor, I, I have less experience than Dan's series of one. One. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jangit or Professor Ravi, you want to ask any question? Otherwise, we go to the concluding remarks. With permission of everybody, I would like to make uh, some concluding remarks about what we did today. So... We had a very splendid moderators from North, East, South, West of India. But above all, the faculty from AAOS OTA, Dr. Daniel and Dr. Frank, you were really, frankly, very, very dandy. And my colleagues, Dr. A.K. Pal, Subhash Jangid and C. Ravi, you have been wonderful co-moderators. The course highlights, if I were to inform to you, that... Uh, we did uh, how to perform procedures associated with acute trauma, call for responsibility in upper extremity, manage the patients, uh, cases involving fracture specific uh, staging principles, positioning methods, avoid complications such as infection, implant failure, non-unions, and execute open and minimally invasive surgical procedures approaches focusing on anatomy, implant position, and claim position. 
I thank all of you to be there throughout uh, the whole proceedings of uh, today's wonderful webinar. We call it Saturday evening lecture series. And I thank uh, IPCA for having uh, sponsored this uh, webinar on Saturday evening lecture series. And uh, if there is somebody present from IPCA wants to say something, otherwise we open up in the gallery mode and everybody should be present over there and let's take a screenshot so that we all uh, can uh, have a good memory. From Ipka, anybody wants to say something or we just conclude? Sir, uh, myself Ashwini from Ipka. I would like to thank uh, the AAOS faculty, Dr. Dan, Dr. Frank, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Dr. Jange, Dr. E.K. Pal, and Dr. Ravi for sparing your time. And really, I, I hope everyone has enjoyed the program and had a great learning. And thank you to all the delegates for sparing your time and uh, updating your knowledge. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And let's have one. Yes. Yes. Snapshot. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you and good day to you and good night to my fellow moderators. Thank Hope you. to see you again sometimes in life, Thank in you. person, rather than being on Zoom meetings. Bye-bye and namaste. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Recording stopped.